fascinating. Right Matt Finnegan yeah. now dropping her right in it. Uh, we've got Future Politics panel this morning, also Sunday surgery. So if people have medical complaints, do call in. We're going to be also talking about a brand new drug for migraines as well. Oh. So that's going to be uh, fascinating. And Dr. Rene on, uh, on the hot seat oh, uh, this morning. Oh, Dr. Rene, um, she makes your show. She does. She is your show. And, she is your show. And, and do I feature? Anyway, do you. I feature in that? Paul, do I feature? Yeah, you, you feature. Uh, thank you, Paul Britton. Yeah. Yeah. Next it's time, me. wear a shirt. Excuse me. <laughs> Sorry, wear a shirt. Sorry, I'm back next shows. weekend. David and Renee are next. This is Talk TV. <laughs> This is Talk TV. Want to get to grips with the stories that really matter? To cut through the spin and the BS. Want unvarnished and fiery debate? Then join us for Crosstalk. One o'clock every weekday. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to ab and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat girl. Having a conversation with a professional journalist, he chose to belittle her, diminish her, um, and use sexist language. I can't stand the word casual sexism. There's nothing casual about igniting and using kind of diminishing and belittling language about anyone, especially someone who's trying to do her job. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. And when the media constantly refer to trans criminals, when they are biological men as women, we will no longer put up with these lies about our gender anymore and about our sex. Trans woman is not a woman, a trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. I, that's robust. It's going to cause a, an argument. It's going to cause tension. But we've got to do it, because otherwise this country is going down the path. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying, um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yeah. Quite yeah. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. One parent commented on a review of Peppa Pig that their daughter had begun to lash out since watching the show and added that Peppa is rude, bossy, a liar, tattletale and even more. Say it's not so. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh. It's carry on what just <laughs> happened. Whoa, is it? There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. I know what's uh, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans. Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. It's only about <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes. For... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. And once you get defeated by a guy named Begley, that's <laughs> it. You retire from politics, and you speak to Rosanna on primetime and have a lot more fun. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. They're now trying to say, hey, we've got a really clever idea for the cost of living crisis. Right. Eat cereal for dinner. But for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did to fail her. Yeah, we're we're supposed to it was another era. That. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth.
Look, I'm getting ready for my new primetime show on talk TV and radio, 7 o'clock Saturday night, James Whale Unleash. I don't need you coming in here, following me around with a car. I'm so sorry about this. Saturdays at 7 on talk TV. Hello, everyone. Good morning to you. It's just after 7 o'clock on Sunday, April the 14th. I'm David Bull. Thank you very much indeed for your company on this great uh, Sunday. Right, as you would expect, I have great news for you. Yes, of course I do. It is National Dolphin Day today. <laughs> Very nice, isn't it? Uh, National Dolphin Day today, a day which recognises the social and intelligent mammals of the water. Also, today, it's uh, as it's reach as high as you can day. Ah, it's... I feel good. <laughs> I'm not sure that's quite right, but anyway, it, it's reach as high as you can day. It's a day to expand your horizons and try to attain that dream that seems so hard and so far to reach. Also, uh, former Doctor Who star, also star of the thick of it, Peter Capaldi, is 66 today. Yes, happy birthday to you. Now, what you probably don't know, he's a distant relative of the singer Louis Capaldi. He is also, uh, he has Italian citizenship. And that got me thinking, these Italians get everywhere. Don't they, Gabriella, my lovely producer? A very good morning to you. Right, let's start today's show, shall we? Today's fascinating facts. Well, today's fascinating facts. On this day in 1912, the British-built luxury liner Titanic struck an iceberg in the North Atlantic shortly before midnight and sank in the early hours of the next morning. 1,500 passengers and crew were killed. On this day in 1931, the Ministry of Transport issued the first highway code a set of guidelines and rules for drivers. And on this day in 1983, and I remember this so vividly, the first cordless telephone capable of operating up to 600 feet from base was introduced. It was actually made by Fidelity and British Telecom and sold for a whopping £170. And those are today's fascinating facts. Well, talking of hard to reach and very expensive, Dr. Rennie Hundercamp is here. Good morning. All the best things are. <laughs> Never stray far from base. No. Um, how are you? I'm good. Good. Thank now, you. Grand National. Yes. So, I, so, so yesterday. Now you're no, yes, no, very excited. So, yesterday I said, How do you place a bet, right? And you said, oh, it's, You both, you and Tom Clayton, looked at me like I was a complete idiot. Yes. And yes. Often. Uh, uh, yeah, yes, well, that is true. <laughs> now, I went back and I then worked out how to do said betting. Well done. Yes, well, no, I was very pleased with myself. So, I did that and I sat down and um, actually I went with my gut, okay, mm -hmm. and I put bets on various horses. That's but, how you have to do the Grand National. Well, yes, but then I stupidly also then went with. with one of the horses that everyone said was going to do very well of course now what happened as a result of that i actually lost money but i won money so i i'm actually only down about 10 pounds so i am maximus which as i said was going to win one you did because we, yeah. we discussed it being a horse in rapunzel we did. Yes. We did. Um, so, well done, David. Well, I'm really pleased with that. Now, my mum bet on Cocoa Beach. That didn't go. No, and that no. was the cocktail. So did I. Did you? Yes. Yeah, it didn't do very well. I am Maximus, of course. I told you to do Foxy Jackson. Foxy Jackson was doing really well until, until the end. Until the end, it hit a fence and, and it then it slowed fence. down. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Mr. Incredible, he, he fell over at the first <laughs> fence, so that didn't go uh, very well. But the one that I put money on and I shouldn't have done was Corrich Rambler. Oh. And that was the one that everyone said was going to win, right? But the most interesting thing about this was just the numbers of people who lost money. In fact, punters lost millions at the Grand National yesterday because, um, essentially, because Corrich Rambler did so badly, everyone had bet on Corrich Rambler. I think it's something like 20 million people lost as a result, yeah, so but, the book is very happy. But don't forget that, that your win, I Am Maximus, was also a joint favourite, so the bookies wouldn't have been very happy about him winning. Yeah, uh, it's interesting. About 20 seconds, Corrich Rambler had an unfortunate fall at the first. Oh, yeah, it saved them £5 million. Yeah. This is the spokesman from Paddy Power. Um, but the punters betting on the horse lost an estimated £20 million within moments of the race starting. Couldn't believe it. Look, what you must always remember is you never see a poor bookmaker. That's also true. It's very <laughs> true indeed. But anyway, I really enjoyed it, actually. It's fun. It's but fun. I do think, and what was good Once about... Once a year... Yeah, and I think what was really good about it is the website itself said, do you want to set a limit yes. on how much you bet? And I think that's a really good yeah. thing to do, don't you? Mm. 
yeah, I was very pleased with that. Uh, right, let's talk about some very serious news. In fact, the papers are way behind they the are. news agenda. Well, we were, weren't we? Because I went to bed and this story wasn't happening and mm. I woke up to it. Exactly. Uh, this is the front page of the Sunday Telegraph. We'll talk about this in detail. But Iran has launched swarms of kamikaze drones at Israel. Not just drones, actually, but missiles. Please Iran. Missiles has launched an unprecedented attack on Israel, unleashing a barrage of missiles, rockets and drones from its own territory. This is the really key point, but also from the proxies across the Middle East. So we knew an attack was likely, the intelligence said an attack was likely, but what everyone thought was Iran wasn't going to get, yeah. going to get involved at all and it would come from the proxies. Now, according to this article in The Telegraph, US and British forces reportedly intercepted more than 100 drones after hundreds were launched from Iran in a long-awaited attack. Now, the Iranian state television said ballistic missiles had also been launched in a joint assault designed to overwhelm Israeli air defences deep in the occupied territories. The IDF said missiles were fired from Iran into the state of Israel, of course, uh, the implications of this are significant. They're, they're absolutely huge, David, because this was what we all dreaded six months ago when October 7th happened, and we dreaded that um, Iran, Lebanon, would be dragged into mm. a Middle East war. But unfortunately, we are now at that point, and I think we're at a really juxtaposition for the world where we have to obviously defend our allies mm. and work with them but at the same time work to not cause a world war three so you and i were talking about this earlier now if you remember back on i think wednesday or thereabouts biden actually warned iran not to attack israel and in fact the rhetoric coming out of the united states was very strong he yeah. said that the usa's uh, commitment to israel's security was ironclad the usa would do all it can to protect it from attack from iran so we knew this was coming and this and the background to this for those people who aren't quite clear what happened of course israel had struck against uh, iran's consulate in syria killing a senior commander of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps, this is Mohammad Reza Zahidi, uh, uh, um, uh, and with other members as well. And what was coming out of Iran was very strong words indeed, saying Israel must be punished when they attack our consulate. It is though they attack our soil. This has to be dialed down. It does, but one also wonders if the rhetoric coming out of the West over the last couple of months, especially the states, which has not been that supportive of Israel in their defence of themselves against um, Hamas, maybe that has emboldened Iran because they've looked at that situation and thought, oh, maybe America won't attack us if we attack Israel. It's, it's interesting. We, I've, I've covered this story on multiple days and also obviously different commentators say different things. But there is no doubt that Netanyahu is under pressure. But what we are now seeing is the West actually saying we stand with Israel. Of course, the US aircraft carrier has been moved closer to Israel I mean, I think, there well. are, I think there are some reports that UK and USA aircraft took part in the defence of Israel last night. Indeed. So the UK was involved. There were unconfirmed reports the UK had joined the defence of Israel with fighter jets from Cyprus. Uh, the Ministry of Defence confirmed the UK had moved several additional Royal Air Force jets to the Middle East, which can intercept airborne attacks. I think this is incredibly serious, but I think also what's interesting about this, Iran actually was in a position where it had to attack in some way because it said it was going to do so. And I spoke to military analysts during the week. Now, what's interesting about these, these were coordinated precision strikes and obviously the damage is limited. But yeah. what now has to happen is there needs to be a very strong resolve not to retaliate because I think if Israel retaliates, then Iran will retaliate and there is a real fear of wider escalation. I agree. There is today, there will be a UN convention Indeed. on this that Israel have requested. So we will see what the UN stance is as well. Not that I'm saying that obviously that is the be all and end all, but I think we need to hear voices from around the world yeah. to see what's happening. At the end of the day, you know, we have to decide who the enemy is here, don't we? Mm. We have to decide as a world what it is we're trying to achieve. We have to look at the underlying ideology, as I said to you this morning. There is an ideology coming out of the Middle East which is damaging to all of us, mm. not just Israel. And somehow that has to be defeated, David. Um, and uh, the G7 are going to convene today as well. Biden told Netanyahu, Netanyahu the US support for them is ironclad. 
and obviously this is an ongoing uh, situation. The question I have for you this morning is how worried are you about this escalation or possible escalation in the Middle East? I think many people are very concerned indeed. The number 0344 499 1000. You can also WhatsApp us to the same number. Also, you can text the word talk and your message to 8722. You can also tweet us, sorry, X us at Talk TV. Leave a space, then hashtag breakfast doctors, although you have left your laptop no, at home. No, I have my phone. It's fine. <laughs> how can you forget every week not to bring it in? It's early. <laughs> when I get it's up. It's very, it's very, very <laughs> early indeed. Uh, also, it's Sunday, of course, so we're going to yes. be uh, talking a lot about medicine today. The last hour of this show is all about medical problems. If you want some medical advice, please do call in as well. Uh, Dr. Rene here, <laughs> all prepped and raring to go without a doubt. I've got so many stories I want to get through, but because of what's going on in the Middle East, we're going to take a break. After the break, Dr. Roger Gewald will be with us to talk about the geopolitics behind this and what the West has to do now, what Iran has to do now, and what the rest of the Middle East has to do to actually dial down this uh, confrontation. Don't go anywhere. This is Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting the badge. Quite um, right, too. Hey, Quite hey. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss him. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know what's I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did fail her. We're supposed to, her. We're supposed to was have another moved on from era. that. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to Weekend Breakfast. I'm David Bull. The time 7.18. Dr. Rennie in the house as well. Thank you very much indeed uh, for your company. If you are just joining us, the front page of the Sunday Telegraph, Iran launches swarm of kamikaze drones at Israel. That's not the full story, actually. It's uh, drones. Uh, this was also uh, missiles as well. We saw that uh, they were intercepted by the US. Also, the United Kingdom involved as well as well as uh, Israel itself, Iran has launched an unprecedented attack on Israel, unleashing a barrage of missiles, rockets and drones 
The interesting part about this is they have come from Iran itself and not just from the proxies, which we would believed would be the case. This attack had been widely uh, speculated to be happening. All the intelligence coming out of the United States said an attack was imminent. Joe Biden, of course, warning Iran, do not attack Israel. Of course, Israel then went ahead and did exactly that. Uh, Steph has just contacted us via WhatsApp saying, I think Iran has been wanting to do this for some time. They would like nothing more than to destroy Israel. The question is, what happens from here? Of course, uh, we know that Netanyahu has a war cabinet uh, briefing. Also, the G7 are convening to meet. And, and I suppose the question is, how worried are you about the escalation in the Middle East? Please let us know, 0344 499 1000. You can also WhatsApp us to the same number. You can also text us, text the word talk in your message to 87 trouble to you, and you can X us at Talk TV. Leave a space, then hashtag breakfast doctors. So then the question remains, what about the geopolitics? What about the political forces at play here? We were just talking about uh, the rhetoric and trying to dial it down and, and the United States actually saying to Israel, do not respond to Iran. Well, joining us now is Dr. Roger Gawalb, who uh, is here to talk about the wider geopolitics. Good morning, Roger. Good morning, David. Can I, I start by asking you that question? How worried are you about the escalation in the Middle East? I'm not uh, all that terribly worried, but it really depends on uh, what Israel determines the targets of this attack actually were, uh, whether this was just a token retaliation or something more serious. And of course, it also depends on what Iran does, if anything, uh, before Israel reacts. So, so that's a really interesting point. And we knew this attack was imminent. The US intelligence said it was imminent, I think, back in, on Wednesday, actually. Reports that the USA was preparing to intercept those missiles. And the USA told Iran, we will intercept those missile, missiles if you strike. Israel then also said it would strike back against Iran. So we knew this was coming. What, what, do, you, what do you sort of read into the fact that it didn't just come from the proxies? It came from Iran itself itself. That being said, of course, Iran said it would act. And I think in many ways, Iran had no choice but to act because otherwise they would be hollow words. Um, both your good self and a lot of other people are starting this at the point where the uh, general was assassinated in Syria. That, that's not where this begins, David. Um, basically, um, it begins with October the 7th, and the fact that uh, it's pretty clear that General Zahidi is the man who pushed the button and activated Hamas to commit October 7th. That's why he was taken out. Yep. So in, in a sense, it's not Israel that started this, it's Iran through its proxy Hamas. Now, the idea, I'm sorry. No, no, carry on. The idea that Israel should not retaliate um, is, is really not something I ascribe much credence to. Um, you have a sovereign nation which has invaded and attacked another sovereign nation, and uh, no nation could stand by and do nothing about that. They were warned. Um, and then I said that it depends on where the targets were. Uh, there's a lot of attention being paid to things such as um, it may have been the case that the Dimona nuclear reactor was actually a target, but they missed. The Iranian um, missiles and um, drones are not all that accurate. They're not the best in the world. And of course, if Iran was trying to blow up a nuclear reactor in Israel rather than just make kind of a token show of force, that's certainly going to change uh, the level and degree of Israel's retaliation. Uh, which could be to simply wipe out, you know, the Iranian regime uh, to something much less moderate. But I really don't see them sitting by and doing nothing and saying, OK, we're quits, because they aren't really quits because Iran started this by October the 7th. Now, now you could also argue that actually these strikes were very targeted. They were precision strikes. When you look at the collateral damage, it's pretty minimal. And, and this is what many defence analysts were saying to me in the week. They said that actually when Iran strikes, they will be very careful as to the targets that they strike for fear of inflaming and escalating that. Do you buy that? 
No, I don't. I mean, Iran, ha Israel has the most precise and efficient uh, weaponry in, in the world, really, whereas Iran has uh, stockpiles of, of cheaper, uh, less effective weapons. But if they come at you in the hundreds and the thousands, then they're going to be very damaging. Um, it's it's not U.S. and U.K. and Jordanian jets which took out these uh, missiles, David. Uh, it's basically the Israeli Iron Dome defense system which got most of them. Um, however, uh, quite a large number, some say most, were actually uh, taken out uh, outside of Israeli uh, uh, airspace. Um, so I don't think that they were carefully targeted not to do any serious damage. But that's what's being looked at, because if they were targeted to hit, say, that nuclear reactor, it's a, it's another kettle of fish. I think this all started back in December. I, I announced on American television, as did many others, that Iran was one week away from actually having a nuclear bomb uh, and that within a month or two, they would have several nuclear bombs. And I think, uh, to use a word you used, uh, that emboldened them and moved them forward, plus uh, Joe Biden unbelievably uh, giving them $6 billion. That emboldened them to push the button through General Zahidi uh, on the 7th of October. And uh, it's all been downhill from there. So I, I, think, I, I think Israel's response will be measured if all this is is a somewhat token retaliation, but uh, while I'm not expecting uh, escalation into World War III by any means, I do think it could become more severe, firstly, if Iran does anything else, uh, and uh, secondly, uh, if Israel discovers that this was meant to be a much more serious attack. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the states. Uh, Joe Biden has said to uh, Benjamin Netanyahu in a phone call that Israel will not, uh, America, I'm sorry, will not be involved in any offensive measures that Israel takes, but reading between the lines, they certainly will be there uh, for the defensive measures. Uh, absolutely, Roger. And of course, uh, Biden saying that the uh, the support is ironclad. We also know the US has moved the USS Eisenhower aircraft and three other warships closer to Israel. The United yes. Kingdom Prime Minister also condemned the reckless attack and said the UK would stand up for Israel's security. Roger, very good to talk to you. Thank you very much indeed for your insight. That's Dr. Roger Gewalt there, geopolitical <coughs> expert. Um, I'm asking this morning, how worried are you about what's going on uh, Gary says, in, with regards to the Middle East, I'm more worried about the competence and foolishness of our own government to put us at risk and make dire decisions to get involved and drag us all into it. I think that's exactly what the US is saying and the UK as well. They will support Israel but not go on the offensive against Iran. Uh, Sue says, I'm worried about what Iran will do next. However, we need to stand up to these vile ideologists, including the ones in our own country. We'll talk about that in a minute, actually. It's a really interesting point, Sue. Thank you very much indeed. And Bill in Cheshire says, recent history shows all roads lead to Iran. Without their support, most terrorist group wouldn't exist or easily uh, could be eradicated. Without them poking the bear, that is Israel, via their proxies, Israel would not be so intransigent. Strong, united, measured response. That's what we need. Diplomatic, military to Iran is the priority, and of course, talking there about the proxies like Hamas, Hezbollah, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, for example, the Houthis, and Iran, uh, Doctor, uh, Iran playing a game here and sponsoring all of those mm. those proxies. But the fact that Iran also launched missiles from its own territory really worries me. And apparently, some of them into Jordan as well, so they weren't just aimed at Israel. So they are they are shaking and, up and the And Jordan Middle responded East. as well. They did. There is. Everything that you've just said is being reiterated in many of the messages that I have. Can we be mm. calm? Can we do this? There is one from Emmy Rose that says, while some in the West will try to spin Iran's attack as Israel's fault, it is in reality good versus evil. And I've said this to you many a time. It's this ideology that is underpinning is all of this that somehow we need to strip bare from all of the West. We, we do, and I want to talk about this a little later on in the show, but also the ideology permeating the United Kingdom. Yes, but well, that's what is, I mean. Well, we talked about this, you know, in terms of the Muslim vote here as well, that, that young kids are being indoctrinated and they're mm. being told things. And, and I'm deeply concerned about the ideology that's permeating this yes, country. I agree with you. And, you know, I've said this all along and it is here on our streets and we need to man up, stop actually hiding behind nice words and hurty feelings and 
say, say it for what it is. Mm. Rene, thank you very much indeed. Uh, let's move on to this morning's uh, papers. Joining us this morning, I'm delighted to say, is David Soffer, who's founder and editor of TechRound. Good morning to you. Good morning, David. Tell us, uh, what is TechRound? TechRound is, it's exciting, it's the UK's fastest growing publication for startups, tech and entrepreneurs. Very good. Very, how's it going? Very well. We started it a while ago and it's grown very nicely, so there's no complaints for me. Fantastic. Well, I'm, I'm delighted for you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Just before we go through the papers with you, let's look at this morning's front pages. Although, as I said right at the beginning, many of these are actually out of date. Let's start with the Sunday Telegraph, this headline, Iran launches swarm of kamikaze drones at Israel. Iran last night launched a major drone attack on Israel. Netanyahu said the country was prepared for a direct attack for the first time. The IDF said Iran had launched these dozens of drones from within its own territory, signalling the long-awaited attack on Israel's territory had begun. Israeli forces said warships and fighter jets were on high alert. The US was working to help intercept the drones. So obviously this is way behind where we uh, now are. The Sunday Times has a completely different front page. I think many of these front pages being reprinted. Uh, the Sunday uh, Times says Badenoch fury at cowardice over gender. The battle over gender ideology is just beginning, warns Kemi Badenoch. She calls for more bravery and less cancel culture in the wake of that landmark review by Hilary Cass, which we talked about uh, during the week. She also launched an extraordinary broadside against politicians of every stripe, the police, the media, the NHS and universities. She said the cowardice of those in positions of influence was worse than the ravings of the militants. Moving on to the mail, we're going to talk about this as well. This is about Angela Rayner. That story won't go away. As I said yesterday, Angela Rayner now facing mounting pressure because one of her former aides, and this is where the story gets even more interesting, one of her former aides has come forward, this is Matt Finnegan, and basically said that Angela Rayner is not telling the truth, that she didn't live in the house that she says she was living in. And this obviously comes as Greater Manchester Police uh, start to investigate Angela Rayner. But uh, obviously that begs questions about Angela Rayner, whether she'll have to step down. What does it say also about Keir Starmer himself? We'll talk about that later on as well. The Sunday Express, far left plot to hijack Labour. I've said for a long time this lead from Labour isn't quite what it seems. Well, apparently, according to this paper, Labour is facing a vicious civil war that could kill off Sir Keir Starmer's hopes of a landslide election victory. Left-wingers are poised to launch a bid for the deputy leadership if Angela Rayner is forced to quit. So it raises the prospect of a summer of bitter infighting to stop a Corbynista winning a seat at the top table. That's this, fascinating. This is very interesting. In combination with something I'm reading that leaked documents show that Home Office Islamic Network say they aim to recruit Muslim staff and influence policy makers to support Muslim needs. They've so far recruited 700 Home Office staff. Only Muslims can become full members. So everywhere in our society this is being mm -hmm. extrapolated out. We're seeing in our politics, we're seeing it in our Home Office. We'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. Also what it means for Labour because obviously exactly. Labour relies on that Muslim exactly. vote. So, so if you've got then the hard left coming in and they don't like what Starmer's doing but we're, I'm digressing. You Let's are. just go. <laughs> I am. I'm and not. I helped you. You did. You, it was completely <laughs> awful. Uh, the Observer at risk children farmed out to illegal private care homes. Hundreds of extremely vulnerable school aged children in England are being sent to illegal, unregulated homes every year because of a chronic shortage of places in secure local authority units. Um, then the Mirror. Uh, Fury at Meghan, <laughs> Meghan small, small. brother's sick <laughs> YouTube vids. Apparently the Duchess of Sussex brother has been blasted for running a vile new campaign of abuse against her on his YouTube <sighs> channel. I really don't Anyone care? mind. Yes. Um, the Sunday People, Evra's 4am kiss. This is footy legend Patrick uh, Patrice Evra. Uh, apparently showing some tight moves, kissing a lady who shouldn't be kissing outside a nightclub. Mm. The Sun on Sunday. <laughs> Cowell, this is Simon Cowell, backs Amanda in Sharon's storm. Yes, Simon Cowell apparently has backed Amanda Holden after her extraordinary public bust up with Sharon Osbourne. All I can say is Sharon's a friend of mine and I'm backing her because uh, I wouldn't dare not. And then the uh, Daily Star, my name is Fido and I'm a tele addict. Apparently, three out of ten cats and dogs are hooked Should on TV. Should have started with the serious news first, huh? <laughs> well, this one. <laughs> yes, exactly. Right. Uh, so sorry, David. Um, <laughs> we, we digress. Uh, Dr Rennie kept, uh, kept butting in there. Um, so can I just ask you for your thought, just before we go through this, 
um, your thoughts on where we are uh, with Iran, with Israel. We both woke up, I was about to say, not together, <laughs> but we woke up to, to the news of what was, was going on. How worried are you? I actually went to bed with the news. Of the Did you? Yeah, so... It, it's You're braver than us. We are. go to bed early. Mm. <laughs> I wish I did. <laughs> so uh, it's obviously concerning, and I think Iran had to be seen to do something after the bombing of, of you know, in, in Damascus. But obviously everyone's you know, worried about it. But I think it is, as you said, it's very much kind of a, a good versus evil kind of thing going on. Maybe one of the texts. It was a, a good versus evil thing going on. Um, and I think, you know, rather than I think sometimes people like to sit on the fence a bit and say, well, six of this, half a dozen of the other... I think it, it's kind of high time that people start saying, OK, <clears throat> this side is wrong, this side is right. Mm. You know, Iran are attacking Israel. They're sending a lot mm. of drones across. You know, but it's obviously it's concerning for everyone in you know, the Middle East and the wider world. But I think what was quite heartening in a weird sense to see was other countries around Israel saying, OK, you know, we're closing our airspace and we're going to kind of assist you where mm. we can. Mm. So I think that's... Do you, especially after the last few weeks. Exactly. Looks, exactly. Do, do you, what, what do you read into the fact that the attacks came from Iran itself and not from the proxies themselves? So many people were speculating, saying an attack is imminent, likely, and it will come from the proxies. I think many people caught out that it came from Iran itself. That's, that's, uh, and the word I used, as Roger said, was emboldening for yeah. Iran. Yeah. Um, you could look at it a few ways. It could be an act of war, and that's obviously the concern. <clears throat> Sorry, that's obviously the concern that people have. But... You know, e equally, Iran have been emboldened, and I think, mm. you know, with my limited geopolitical knowledge, I think when you have a, a quite a weak America and you have a very kind of weak world, someone and somehow is going to step into that void, and Iran are very emboldened to do so. Can I just ask you for your response on this, and it's a really good message, uh, who's this from, Michael? Dear doctors, how concerned should we be the ideology you speak of is now represented in the House of Commons in the form of George Galloway? Mm. And, and we know that as the general election approaches, there mm. are going to be Muslim candidates put forward by Galloway at et al. And that changes the dynamic. Should we be concerned? And Rennie's point, I think, is very valid about ideology. Kids being told stuff in this country, British kids being told stuff and being indoctrinated with stuff that, that quite frankly, isn't true. I mean, on George Galloway, I think I don't think he mentions his constituency very much in the House of Commons anyway, so I'm, <laughs> I'm not really sure how much weight I give to that. In terms of what children are being told, look, I think children should be allowed to be children. I, think, I agree. I think, 100%. Yeah, I think, you know, whether it's politics or whether it's anything else, let kids be kids. But we do see, actually, on that mm. note, every weekend now, middle-class white families taking their four-year-olds like it's a day out on marches. Yes, I would agree. And, in fact, this is Vicky in Scarborough agrees with you. Good morning, David and Rennie. I think Iran has been emboldened by the pro-Palestinian marches around the world. Yep. It's very frightening. And I agree. And also, we're not seeing the police clamping down on that. London has become a no-go area uh, during those marches. Um, anyway, we will talk more about this a, a little later on. Right, now, you've chosen some crackers. Take us through uh, your first story from the Mail on Sunday. Yeah, the first story is there's this new offence that they're very proud of creating that it's it's now illegal to assault shop workers. But mm. Surely it was illegal to assault anyone Exactly, before. exactly. I would have thought so. You can't go around assaulting people. Well, ex exactly. That's what I thought. And I think it, it kind of opens a can of worms because it's already illegal. They should enforce the laws that they're already in place to say assault was assault. Which they seem impossible. They, they find this impossible now. I mean, does this mean that you can assault someone who's not a shop worker? <laughs> no. I mean, this is crazy. No, no, indeed. But actually, there's a much bigger issue here, isn't there? What is going on in our shops where people think that they can walk in, nick stuff? I've seen it in my, yeah. in my local supermarket. I, I, I've told this story before. I was on the tube and this man opened his coat and he had salmon hanging off <laughs> from under his coat and steak. Did you buy any? <laughs> no, I didn't buy any. <laughs> but but what, what, what's your, what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, it, it, it's a very nice political move to say, look, we're, we're protecting shop workers specifically. The only offence, I would say, where there's a, an additional um, degree of, of... There should be an additional degree of something, rather, is you know, the assault on an emergency worker who put themselves you know, front and centre. So an extra layer to protect them makes sense. But I think here, I think really it's just a case of enforcing the laws that they have. But shoplifting is increasingly becoming quite trivialised. And like you say, everyone's mm. seen it in their local shop. Well, it's shop. effectively been decriminalised. Decriminalised. Exactly. And, yeah. and if it's under £200 that's stolen, 
I don't think they even get 250. prosecuted. 250. Well, there we go. They, they well, don't even well, get prosecuted. Well, the shopkeepers don't even call the police if it's under £250 because they won't be, they won't be prosecuted. So that then emboldens shoplifters who are probably then ending up when they're being challenged. But I also blame the shops because as the fact we have fewer staff now at the tills, for example, it's all self-checkout. No one monitors what's going on. So, in fact, they've cut costs, and I think that's part of the problem, actually. I'm actually with the old-fashioned belief that I think when people live within a society, and I, I'm guilty of this myself, you go into a shop and you kind of do your own thing. But what I've increasingly started doing is you can spot the shoplifters. I think everyone everyone can see them as they're doing it. If someone's mm. taking 15 packets of sirloin steak, they're normally going to steal them. So I, I had a story. I saw that happening. I saw the guy and I just looked at him and I actually, I suppose to quote Joe Biden, I just said, don't. And he sort of looked at me and he ran out of the shop, grabbed him by his rucksack. He dropped all his stuff. And, and my, my wife was sitting outside the shop and she said, all I saw was a man come flying out of the shop. I said, yeah, look, he was trying to shoplift from this place and he ended up out of the shop. You're very brave. So, well, you are that, very brave. Well, I think this is what people said, but I don't think it's actually brave. I think it's just you're living in an area and you're thinking, I don't want people to it's steal things from my shop. It's a community spirit. Yes. yes, that's what I think. So yeah. I noticed yesterday I went into a chemist, a very big chemist in my local area, um, which has now got a security guard at the door, which they've never had before. Okay. I know, it's absolutely terrible. Um, so this is uh, ministers, obviously, saying, apparently uh, this, uh, the shoplifting is costing a billion pounds a, a year, and, of course, it's coming out of our own pockets. Let's take a quick break, if we can. We'll come back to you and the rest of your stories after this break. Don't go anywhere. This is Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss it. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't <laughs> too keen on that. I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <you've got> <laughs> Yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family, and if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. Yeah, we're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth.
Welcome back to Weekend Breakfast. Dr. Rennie getting up, wandering around the studio for no apparent reason. You want to play with the temperature, do you? I do, yes, I see. Can we do that in a minute? Yes. Yeah, fine, okay. Welcome back to Weekend Breakfast. Time 7.43. Lots of you getting in touch, actually. I'm asking this morning, how worried are you about the escalation in the Middle East? The number 0344 499 1000. You can WhatsApp us as well. You can also text us, text the word talking your message to 8722. You can also X us at Talk TV. Leave a space, hashtag Breakfast Doctors. That's what Nick Moore has done. Dearest David and Rene, thank you for giving me a reason to get up on a Sunday. Aww. That's very sweet. Thank you. Uh, weak liberal governments have unwittingly seeded our institutions mm -hmm. with hardline sleeper Islamists for years in the name of diversity and inclusion. On the 7th of October, they fired the starting gun in Israel and now their plan is underway. We have been warning our feckless leaders for years and now we reap the whirlwind. I love your show, by the way. Thank you very much thank indeed. You. Keep all of those messages coming in. We're joined this morning by David Soffer, who's founder and editor of Tech Round. Now, you have chosen a very interesting story. This is in the Sun, paid big spread, 30 and 31, about Azempic. Yeah, Azempic's really interesting. I think, I mean, you're both doctors here, so I'm going to kind of defer to you for, for the medical bit here. So I'm out medical here. But I think I've already made my mind clear on this. <laughs> so, yes. I mean, look, my view on, on Azempic is I'm sure there are people who this is very good for, people who maybe there is no other way. But uh, forgive me if, it, if this comes across wrong, but I think move more and eat less. And I think generally that's the way you're going to lose weight. And if you, it's a really interesting thing. If you look at pictures of people on the beach in like, what, the 1970s yeah. or something, very few people yeah. were... They all look like me. So overweight. They, they, were, they, were, they weren't as beautiful as you. <laughs> Blow your oh, 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 my God. You know, they, they, they looked all right. So people didn't look like... I say a lot of people look now, and it's almost like an easy way out for people well, sometimes. Well, I mean, so, so we'll come on to what the story is, but when you look at the numbers, 68% of men are overweight or obese, 59% yeah. of women in this country, and you're right. When you look back post-war, no one was overweight yeah. because, of course, the diet was actually very measured because of the ration card, for example, and, but, and so on. But let's let's just add into this. We live in an obesogenic society. We do, we now. do, and it's about so, the food and what's added to the food. Whilst I agree 100%, that everybody can lose weight. I don't care what anyone says, everyone can lose weight because nobody comes out of a famine overweight. But we live in a society where people are eating, 80% of their diet is ultra processed and ultra processed food is responsible for obesity and cancer. But going to this story, mm. talking about risks and benefits. Well, so let me just explain what this story is. Dieters buying fake MP, this is yeah. semaglutide, um, gambling with health. So just before we go back to Dr. Rene, so what does this story say? So this, this, this to me speaks to a slightly wider problem because I think people start with one thing. Okay, Zempic, yeah, that can work. Well, I kind of want a shortcut. Maybe I don't even need it. The doctors won't give it to me. That's let the me key. Get, let me get a shortcut. But I think I put this not quite in the same bracket as vaping, but I think that when you take vaping and you take a Zempic and you look at it and you say, well, okay, there's, in the case of vaping, you have a very nice flavoured, I don't know, watermelon, ice flavour, powder, powder or whatever, in a thing that's heated up, you're breathing it in, it, you don't know what's in it, and no one knows the long-term effect of azempic nor vaping. And I think they're two things that are very normalised very quickly without understanding enough about it. I, I think the, the, the story here really is, is less about semaglutide itself for the, the GLP-1 agonist, but it's more about yeah. people that, your point really valid, which is they can't get it and they're buying it from spurious sources and they don't right. know what's in it. So I'm going to speak to both of those points. Obviously, you should never buy medication online because you have no idea what's in it and it can kill you. Mm. End of story. And we're seeing that. Whether it's and we'll vape, talk about that with xylazine, we'll talk about for example. Later, we yeah. have an issue with vapes and things in them. Having said that, a Zempic as a, as a drug, as we know, to lose weight is not an innocent party either. There is a high risk of pancreatitis. Yep. There is um, possibly a risk of thyroid cancer. We're just not sure. So the makers say, don't take this if you've got thyroid problems or thyroid cancer. Um, as soon as you stop taking it, you're appetite comes roaring back and you just put the weight on again. This is a shortcut to nowhere with potential health risks along now the, the way. Now the problem we've got also is those people who actually go online and then say well I've been taking semaglutide, it's fantastic and look how much weight I've lost but your point is really valid and I see so many people going online and buying all sorts of drugs, whether they're benzodiazepines for example or whatever online, you have no idea what's in it. 
you don't know what's in it. And but I, again, I, I think it's kind of enabled by a, a, a wider culture of a quick fix to something very quickly. I don't care whether I should have it or shouldn't have it. I'm going to look for something <laughs> yeah. that will give me those results. Yeah. And I don't think that's very clever. So this is about I don't want to do any hard work. I want a quick Ex fix. Exactly. It's not easy to get up and go to the gym or go and run or it maybe, really isn't. you know, reduce what you eat. But And to eat less, it's not you know. easy. And I don't pretend when I talk to patients, I always say to them, really, it's not easy. And they look at me and they go, it's easy for you. No, it isn't. I don't have any willpower. <laughs> I, I buy nothing. My house is empty of food so but, that I don't eat. And that's the key. I don't put anything in the fridge exactly. because I know I don't trust myself. Mm -hmm. So when I open the fridge door, I'll eat anything that's in it. But yeah. I think the beauty of it is once people, I think, start getting up and moving a lot more, they realise I can eat a lot more of what I like because I'm moving a lot Correct. more. Correct. And also just in terms of the other health benefits, because actually going to the gym is very hard work. But once you've been there, you actually feel really good. Exactly. And, and we know that actually a lot of people are very depressed in this country. It's a really interesting article, this. Uh, let's move on now to your article in, <laughs> in the Sunday Express. We've talked a lot about MPs not really knowing or there being no leadership in this country or no governance or aspirational vision and this speaks to that it does and i think it actually shows that and this is across the board from left to right in every direction what's the story tell me because this one i don't know ah uh, well so do you want to explain so i mean M mps have been taking essentially books out of the libraries in the commons about how to be an mp essentially <laughs> Um, it's brilliant. I, I think it just speaks. It just speaks. To, I think how low the bar has fallen. So, so, so books borrowed from the House of Commons Library. This is um, so obviously Idiot's members can go. MPs. Yes, it is. Idiot's guide. How to be a minister. How to run a government. There were 166 titles taken out by Tory members. Was choosing the Tory leader. They all read Matt Hancock's pandemic diaries oh and God. the secret of uh, uh, the, the diary of a secret Tory MP. They have 650 members from all parties. Those 650 members, how many books do you think they actually read between them? Three. 294. <laughs> <laughs> I think they need to read more. I think they need to read more, but I think this really speaks to the problem of they are almost not real people. And when you hear them <laughs> often talking, you think just, I mean, besides the fact when you think answer the question, you just think, you know, what what, what have you done to, to, to get to this point where you make such big decisions? and. I always laugh because you see again this is left and right this doesn't no, there's no. no party in particular on the one hand you have some people saying you know what what did you do as a job for an mp and they say well i was an investment banker You're like okay cool and on the other side you see what did you do well i went for university i worked for a council and now i work for the government i've had a real job and you're thinking no you haven't <laughs> you yeah. don't have any real world yeah. experience well they've all done ppe politics philosophy and economics at oxford or cambridge they haven't done a real job they have no, they're not equipped to go into government they have no understanding of actually how people feel a bit like andrew bailey doing history <laughs> yeah that's so brilliant i didn't know that <laughs> the, the governor of the bank of england we found out actually doesn't have a financial background <laughs> i mean I, my, my view on this is i would sack every single mp all of them yeah. and i would say if you've run as an mp in the last 20 years you cannot run start again why because I just think it's just... But there the are some good ones. There are some good ones, but I think it, it's kind of outweighed. And I think the fact that when... I think when you look at the House of Commons, you could probably count on your hands the number of MPs, again, across the sure. board, that you'd say, like, that person has real principles, that person has real experience. They're all just in it for kind of playing and the game. And they're not queuing up to borrow the books. So, so no. obviously, <laughs> I have a slightly different uh, take on this, given that I'm involved in politics. But actually, being standing as a, a member of parliament or going through that political process and campaigning and all that is miserable. It's utterly miserable. But you're right. There is a subsection of people who do it because they feel it's the right thing to do. My real concern is, actually, we get the wrong people because you have to be relatively affluent Look, to go got, into it to afford to campaign. We've got 27-year-olds being appointed to our House of Lords. Well, I would start with the House of Lords. Laws, wouldn't you? House of Laws is a funny one, isn't it? Because <laughs> well, yes. yeah, the House of Laws is a very funny one. But I, I actually would start the House of Commons simply because it kind of the laws almost start there. And I think if you start with the House of Commons, and again, I I look at the government, I look at the opposition, I look at every party, and I can count on my hands the number of people I think they would do a good job. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I I, I I I don't disagree actually. But so also you think to summarise that the books aren't working. <laughs> well, either the books aren't working or they're reading the wrong books. <laughs> Well, also, they have to be an MP to take those books out in the first place, so oh, therefore... And I was wondering, if they if they bring them back late, do they get fined? Because if they get fined, they're going to expense it. <laughs> so it's going to cost all of us anyway. They are. Very, very true indeed. Um, now, Angela Rayner, this, this story just won't go away. And um, this is The Observer. This is Rayner will carry on campaigning despite 
for smears. What is your view on this? I said during the week when I was doing breakfast, I said, I think I did it on Monday and then I did it again on Friday, and I said this story is not going away anytime soon and now we've got someone who used to work for her saying that essentially her story is wrong. She is not telling the truth. We've got an investigation by Greater Manchester Police. What do you think about where we are? Well, I think to start, I think Angelina you know, selling a council house, capital gains tax, that in and of itself, there's nothing wrong with that. And, you know, power to her for that. However, I think the problem emerges where, number one, most people in this country don't have the ability nor the resources to sell a house, make 40 something thousand. 48,500. 40, exactly. And then, you know, then do all the capital gains tax bits around that. So that's the first point. She's well, in a very but, nice but position to do yesterday. that. I said this yesterday. She did it under right to buy scheme, which she yes. is against, for example. But also she may well have broken electoral law. And, and that is very serious. And, and what's actually really funny is if you are innocent of something, it's really easy to prove it. Exactly. Because if somebody said to me, David, you five minutes ago went into a shop and you stole a hundred pounds worth of whiskey. I'd say, no, no, it's really easy. I was with David and Renee. They'll tell you I was with them. Here, look, I didn't steal anything. Never Case seen closed. before in my life. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, there we go. <laughs> but it's very easy to prove you're innocent when you're innocent, unless it's a very complex case, which this isn't. If she's innocent, just prove your innocence. Yeah, well, she's, but she's... she also, the hypocrisy, because of course she went after the Hartlepool candidate, the Conservative candidate, saying, prove, show me your financial, your, your records, financial yeah. records. She went after Ak Shatamurti saying, show me your financial records. Yeah. Now everyone's saying to her, show me your financial records. She's like, no, I'm not going to do that. It doesn't look good, Which does also it? begs the question, what else might they find in there? Yeah. Well, that's a I'm not suggesting there is anything, you know, but who knows? Do you remember how much um, Keir believed in Corbyn? Yes. Watch how much he doesn't believe in Rainer by the end of the week. So you think he'll change position? Yes. But we saw that, didn't we? Because he was asked twice whether he, he had 100% confidence in Angela Rayner. He refused to answer that. He, he was then, a self-survival animal. Very much, very much so. And of course, that then links beautifully to that story we did about the, the hard left watching what happens to Angela Rayner. And they will then regroup. And it will be fascinating to see what happens. And of course, they're all bothering to come back tomorrow, which is nice <laughs> of them, isn't it? Well, it, it, uh, sorry, just to add, I think it also just adds to the fact that, like I say, a lot of MPs are kind of all the same. Whether you're on one party or the yep. other, the same scandals affect them. And, and this is my concern, is that what it does is it undermines faith in politics generally. And totally. there are people who really want to make this country a better place and they get drowned out by all the bad apples, I think. Apple, and yeah. shall we move finally to your, to your last story? Doing whole lot of good. So this is one where a police and crime commissioner, I think it was in Devon and Cornwall, wasn't it? Yep. Um, well, she said that criminals should be made to kind of fill in potholes and sort the roads out. I don't think it's a terrible idea. No, it's a brilliant idea. brilliant idea. But I just find it really funny that a police and crime commissioner comes up with this rather than a mayor who's responsible <laughs> for the roads or the government who's responsible for the roads. I, I've actually, I say to a lot of people, I say, I, I think for politics, if you're, for example, mayor of London and please, you know, Sadiq Khan, take this from me and fix these problems or whoever wants to take Sadiq Khan's place, fix these problems. Crime, congestion and council tax. If you reduce those three things, everyone's lives will get better. But you see, yes, and of course we have to be careful not to be London-centric. There are real problems in London. He's looking at pay per mile charging, for example, uh, we, and, and, and we are in Perda, so we need to be careful about that. And of course different candidates vying in different ways. But when you go into the country where I live, the potholes are absolutely outrageous. And I think right up there in terms of how people vote will be potholes. I think potholes are outrageous everywhere. I they mean, are. my road is insane. <laughs> my other half moans you about it tank. every single day. Yeah, you yeah. need a tank. I, I don't yeah. think it even matters is where anyone lives to be honest this is across the country yes. any mayor any mayoral candidate anybody i think if you cut those things and you focus on those things and if i can see this i'm sure they can see this they just choose not to because it's it's, it's you know because three things. rainbow crossings are far more virtual well you, you can't use them if they're closed with potholes anyway so they're wasting <laughs> even no, more you money. can't but also they've got all those rubbish trucks going up and down because i now have to have seven bins not two bins and and round and round it goes and i think it drives people absolutely bonkers and I think it will be right up there when people uh, come to vote. Uh, thank you so much for coming in David. Uh, what are you doing for the rest of the day? Not terribly much. I might, uh, I don't know, go to the gym. Yay! <laughs> very, go fix some potholes. Very, well, I don't know. No, not very really. impressive. If you I, I wish I would. But. Oh, very good. Thank you very much indeed thank for coming you. in. That's David Soffa uh, there. Uh, lots more still to come. Keep all of your messages uh, coming in, please. I'm asking this morning, how worried are you about the escalation in the Middle East? Uh, you can call us 0344 499 1000. Send us a WhatsApp. You can text us. You can also tweet us. Do you have uh, oh, many? So many. Yeah. So I've got Dean Bryce says, Iran is not my worry it's the enemy within you read this out a few weeks ago and i say again look at the history of lebanon that's what's coming for us 
Yeah. Um, Cooperman, this is interesting. Israel should take this opportunity to attack Iran's nuclear facilities to prevent them from developing nuclear weapons and protect the whole world. Attacking nuclear facilities. Mm -hmm. Deeply dangerous. Let's take a quick call if we can. Uh, Chris is in Surrey. Good morning. Good morning, lovely doctors. Good morning, good morning. What's on your mind? Um, it was just, uh, you mentioned uh, Kuzempe. Uh, Kuzempe, uh, yeah, um, semi-glutide. All right. All right, quick, quick history. I'm 63 years old. Uh, I suffered a stroke in 2016 following a accident. Yeah. Um, so that leaves me um, prone to another stroke. So I take uh, clobridogrel. Yeah. Um, I've managed to get myself off of painkillers. I was on uh, 530 cocodamols, at least eight a day, and a couple of tramadols. Um, well I've done. managed to wean myself off of all of them well done. with a chiropr with a chiropractor. Yep. Um, I have a good relationship with my doctor. Good. Sorry, but time is the, tight. All right. During the pandemic, I put on weight caring for my parents. Yep. Um, and uh, uh, I've my blood. I've, I've just done bloods again, uh, and my uh, blood sugar level is horrendous. It's eighty three. You're diabetic, um, then, are you? Yeah, yeah, I went from pre-diabetic from yeah. prior the... Uh, and, and, and very quickly, what do you want to ask or what do you need to know? No, I'm, 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 I asked him for, for Zempic. He's done another blood test. Well, I've got the results and I'm talking to him tomorrow. Good. And I will be prescribed for Zempic. Yeah, but for, for diabetes, it works well. OK, um, uh, we wish you the best of luck, Chris. Thank you very much indeed uh, for your call this morning. We'll answer more of your medical problems a, a little later on. More politics coming up after this break. This is Talk TV. This is Talk TV. For the news that matters, for the opinions that matter, for the stories that matter, find me, Vanessa Phelps, every weekday at 4pm, only on Talk, on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Oi, right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss it. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't <laughs> too keen on that. I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <you've got> to... <laughs> Yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family, and if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, 
has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to it was moved another on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV, it's the only place where you get the truth. Look, I'm getting ready for my new primetime show on talk TV and radio, 7 o'clock Saturday night, James Whale Unleash. I don't need you coming in here, following me around with a cow. I'm so sorry about this. Saturdays at 7 on talk TV. Hello, friend. Good morning to you. It's just after 8 o'clock now on Sunday, April the 14th. I'm David Bull. This is Talk TV. Thank you very much indeed for your company. Great news. Great news this morning. It is National Dolphin Day today. <laughs> it's a day which recognises the social and intelligent mammals of the water. Also today, great news because it's Reach As High As You Can Day. <laughs> Very odd choice, that. A day to expand your horizons and try to attain that dream that seems so hard and so far to reach. Also today is uh, former Doctor Who star, also star of The Thick of It, Peter Capaldi's birthday. Happy birthday! Yay! Yes, so Peter Capaldi is 66 today. Now, what you didn't know is he's a distant relative of singer Louis Capaldi. He also has Italian citizenship, and as I was saying, these Italians, they go everywhere. Like Gabriella, my wonderful uh, producer. Right, let's start today's show, shall we? Today's fascinating facts. So, so today's fascinating facts. On this day in 1912, the British-built luxury liner Titanic struck an iceberg in the North Atlantic shortly before midnight. It sank in the early hours of the next morning. 1,500 passengers and crew were killed. On this day in 1931, the Ministry of Transport issued the first highway code, a set of guidelines and rules for drivers. And on this day in 1983, and I do remember this incredibly vividly because everyone wanted one, the first cordless telephone capable of operating up to 600 feet from the base was introduced. It was made by Fidelity and British Telecom and cost a whopping £170. And those are today's fascinating facts. Well, Dr. René is with me this morning. Now, Dr. René, yes. um, Lewis Oakley. Lewis Oakley. I do know Lewis yes, Oakley very well. So, Lewis Oakley has been banging on me about <laughs> AI, right? So, do you remember he was talking about oh, chat GPT? Yes, he was. And I said, I don't want any of that nonsense. Yeah. I don't want any of that nonsense. Did you use it today for your fascinating no, facts? No. So, he sent me fascinating facts. And good morning to you, Lewis. So, I Lewis. then, wait, so wait for this. So, I then went into this thing and I wrote, tell me some fascinating facts. My goodness, it's like a brave new world. So, uh, also, on this day and look so he sent me this it took him about five seconds to put this together so on this day Abraham Lincoln's assassination in 1865 by John Wilkes Booth at Force Theatre in Washington it came up with the Titanic in 1912 also the first American in space in 1961 first MRI scan you're not going to turn into an AI lover are you quite like it <laughs> I mean it is amazing but I don't know have you used it once it's amazing so I just said, tell me some fascinating facts from this day. And it, uh, what worries me is, uh, obviously, the, the implications for kids and exams. And for our own brains and using and our them own brain. and learning. Yes. Well, it, it does save a lot of time. <laughs> An awful lot of time, actually. Um, but anyway, uh, keep all of your messages coming in. Uh, we're talking also this morning about what's going on uh, in terms of Iran and Israel. And, and I want to move on to that uh, this morning. Dr Chris Hewton, Defence analyst joins us now. Good morning to you, Chris. Good morning. Good morning. I, I wonder if we can start with, with the news that, that's been breaking overnight, that is that Iran has launched an unprecedented attack on Israel, unleashing a barrage of missiles, rockets and drones from its own territory and its proxies across the Middle East. Now, apparently, US and British forces reportedly intercepted more than 100 drones. Hundreds launched from Iran. And we knew this attack was coming. It was warned by the US security services that it was coming. 
Iranian state television said ballistic missiles had also been launched in a joint assault designed, in their words, to overwhelm Israeli air defences. The IDF has confirmed missiles were fired from Iran, saying a short while ago Iran launched missiles from its territory towards the territory of the state of Israel. Israel. I just wonder, Chris, your view. The question I've been asking this morning is how worried should we be about this escalation in the Middle East? Joe Biden, uh, obviously, earlier in the week, saying to Iran, do not attack Israel. He said the uh, United States uh, commitment was ironclad and the US would do everything it can to support Israel. We knew the attack was coming. What do you read into the fact that it came not just from the proxies, but from Iran? itself yeah i mean i find it it is uh, very worrying um, and as you say it's, it's worrying because the iranians have changed strategy um as as you say it's they um used to rely on their proxies to to uh, attack israel and now you know this is the first direct attack from iran to israel so so this is a worrying development um, the Iranians say that it's it's a response to the Israeli attack on the consulate in Damascus um, earlier in April. But I think there are also deeper reasons and deeper re reasons to be concerned as well. Mm. Um, firstly, I think it re represents um, somewhat of a failure of the Iranian proxy strategy. Israel's hammering Hamas. Um, it's uh, it's also been attacking, um, been striking targets in uh, southern Lebanon with with Hezbollah. It's also been striking targets with with regards to um, uh, Iranian backed militias in in Iraq and and Syria, and and therefore, you know this, you know the the, the Iranians needed, you know from from their point of view felt that they they had to do something different. The other reason I think um, is is I think this is concerning, and and the other deeper reason is that. Um, Iran has suffered a, a knock of, of their reputation in, in various different ways. Um, for the, firstly, the, the reasons I, out, I, I outline its strategic frustrations, but the real has been plummeting. It's reached a record bumps. Um, the Iranians have also suffered terrorist attacks from Islamic State and and Baloch. Um, uh, uh, Salaf uh, Salafist um, uh, uh, terrorist groups, and and therefore, you know, I th you know what what makes this also dangerous is that I, I think the the Iranians felt that this was a means of of boosting their their prestige, their their reputation, you know, and, and especially if if you consider, for example, the U.S. strikes on on um, IRGC uh, targets um, early in the year as well. So, so yeah, so so this is probably to um, to distract them from some of the domestic difficulties that, that Iran is facing as well. So we know the G7 is convening as well, uh, also Netanyahu convening his war cabinet as well. There, there, there is a lot of political pressure being applied on Israel from the United States, from the United Kingdom, from its allies saying do not respond. We cannot afford this to escalate. At the same time, uh, the USS Eisenhower being moved closer. So with one hand saying to Israel, we are supporting you, but equally saying we cannot afford for this to escalate any further. Yeah, I, I mean, I think I think another reason perhaps for for the Iranian attack is is, is that the, the the Americans and and to some extent the British as well has has lately kind of distanced itself from Israel, expressed concern and criticism of of Israel, and that that might have, you know, given the the Iranians feeling that there, there could be an opening for for them to uh, to, to attack as well, but um, but everybody I think is is trying to, you know, make their point, demonstrate um, force while simultaneously not escalating this mm -hmm. to a much bigger conflict. Although what Iran has done, um, you know, has has been to, to, to escalate this quite considerably. Whether Iran is going to mount any more attacks, um, we'll, we'll, we'll also have to see what Israel's response is as well. Whether this becomes something that lasts, you know, days, weeks or months, it remains to be seen. But, but everybody is kind of delicately trying to 
plan the right move and the right mm. strategy which which balances the the line between making the point showing resolve but also not letting things get massively out of hand but but iran has made a, a you know a major move here not, nonetheless yeah very good to talk to you chris thank you very much indeed that's dr chris hewton who's a defense analyst i think it's worth just remembering it was a week ago actually to the day the ceasefire talks were taking place with the us the cia director bill burns the qatari prime minister egypt israel and hamas and the two sides remaining very much at loggerheads about what the situation is and on what happens from here israel says it's ready to reach the hostage release deal uh, but will not give in to hamas's extreme demands and the demands from hamas are not compliant or, or certainly aren't going to be met by Israel. Uh, many people pushing still for this two-state solution and we shall watch what happens uh, today with, with care and interest. I think it's also important to state that Hamas can't find more than 40 vulnerable hostages alive. Mm. That's why the peace talks are breaking down as well, that they actually can't fulfil the numbers that Israel wants and, them to and, and do we have those figures verified? Like That's all the of problem. These so, so, Israel, so, so that, say, Israel are saying that Hamas have said that they can't find 40 women, and, children, and, and or the, elderly. And, and, indeed, indeed. And so we believe there are 129 hostages still held. We believe 34 are presumed dead. We don't have those figures. But as I say, we will watch what happens uh, very carefully indeed. Let's move on to some more domestic politics, shall we? Uh, joining us in the studio, Patrick Timms, editor of Wolves of Westminster. Good morning to you. Good morning, good morning to you. Re really good to see you. I mean, I, w in fact, I saw you during the week, didn't I? Yes. Um, yeah. and, and, um, Angela. Arena. Yeah. Uh, we were talking about this yesterday, saying this mm. this story isn't going away anytime soon. And then this morning, here we go again. A former employee of Rayner has provided a statement to the police contradicting her claims. Now, you know, I have talked about this incessantly. She says her primary resident was in Vicarage Road. She bought this house for uh, the former council house for seventy nine thousand, sold it for one hundred and twenty seven thousand five hundred, made forty eight thousand five hundred profit. And a lot of questions being asked about was that your primary residence? Were you living with the husband and the children? Were you registered? Why are all the furnishings in the other house not in this house? And now we see that Mr Finnegan, Matt Finnegan, said he is in no doubt that a residence Miss Rayner shared with her husband was the family home, completely contradicting Angela Rayner. How significant is that? Well, um, it depends on how you define significant. What I would say is that in Westminster, whenever this kind of thing happens, that, that somebody's always got an agenda. But what I wanted to do is just actually try and compare and contrast this with an example from my own life. So I live two lives. I have a house up in Cheshire. Lucky you. I also, I'm, I'm in a property guardianship in North East London. Right. So that I can do things like this. Yes. Now, which is my primary residence? Is it the one that I own? Or, bearing in mind that I actually spend most of my time in London, is it that? They're, both, they're, well, they're both furnished. But it's a, is it a case of where do I spend most of my time or what do I own? It's which one you declare to the tax office as your is. primary residence. It's as simple as that, really. No, it is. It's, I don't need to, in my yeah, case. But, right. of course, she does. So then it's a case of saying, how do you define well, it? Well, but also, just let's go back to the, the reason this is important is the primary residence is the one where you don't pay capital gains. Now, it, if it transpires that she was not living in that property mm. and also she, she registered the children in the other property, yep. my feeling is actually this is starting to snowball. What does it say also about Keir Starmer? Because... He, he, I don't think he knows what his position is on this. Well, that's not a new one, is it? But, I, you know, look, I, I think the way the story was reported, you know, in some uh, outlets was that, you know, is, is Rayner an asset or a liability? Now, I think this is a bit of either or thinking here. And if we, we can think about this in politics, I mean, who else can we think of who has been both an asset and a liability in that order? Boris Johnson. Indeed. OK, so... In terms of what Starmer does, now if you go back a couple of years, there were great tensions between him and Rayner, but there now were. they're gearing up for power. So it depends whether what they're going to actually do is prioritise unity and staying together rather than you know, having a spat so, over this so, right so, now. So, so there's a really interesting article saying that actually Angela Rayner, re the reason that in some ways that people liked her, because she makes no secret of the fact that she likes going out uh, on the oh, razzle, yes. you know, she yeah, yeah. stays up all night. She's not like a normal politician. Uh, she's also sort of triumphed uh, or heralded the fact that she came from very modest beginnings and she's done very well. And all credit to her for that. She calls herself John Prescott in a skirt. Yes. And, and, and she says, I've got cut through. I think there is a, a lot of merit in that, actually. I think she does have cut through. Well, yes, she does. And as I began by saying, I think, you know, it looks like somebody's out to get her. 
it also may be well, the, the case. Well, conservatives are. Well, her former aide, I mean. Um, oh, I see. You see, it can be internal as well. But you know, she she she's got everything to lose here. But the, but the th- there was another interesting story I read. There was a, well a bit of punditry anyway. It was, somebody was saying, well, actually, if you investigate this properly, it could take a couple of years before it comes through. By which time, there could well be in power anyway. So what you mm. then have yeah. is this hanging over her head for quite some time. But is it really going to damage <coughs> her? What's probably the, what's not. The, probably not. Well, when this happened with let's think about Beergate, you know. For Starmer, mm-hmm. and he came out just like she's done and said, well, "I'll resign if I'm full." To be fair, Rayner was part of Beer Gate she too. Was. Yes, yes, but yes, true. But my point is that you know, just like with that, she's come out and said, "I'll resign if I'm found doing anything wrong." Now with Beer Gate, Starmer came out and said uh, the same thing. Did. But they'd taken three independent pieces of legal advice that said they were probably going to be in the clear. So maybe she thinks she is as well. I, I have no doubt that she's taken legal I also advice. wonder if there's another angle to this. And is Angela Rayner the remnant of the far left Labour Party that Kira's had to try and keep together to keep mm. momentum and people that are still in the wings on side? So getting rid of her could rid him completely of that or it could stir them up. I think it will stir them up, and that is the story we're seeing okay. this morning about what happens. If Rayner is removed, yes. what happens next? So I can give you a bit of intel on that. Uh, no, she is not seen by the far, the really far left, as being on their side. No, she really isn't. I mean, the, the last figure you had there who was got rid of would, would be Rebecca Long Bailey. OK, and I was involved in that story. But there we go. So you, you have, you know, at the end of the day, no, I don't think it would be that. You know, the, the far left have some have some great terms for the, 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 the Starmerites. They call mm-hmm. them Troopers. Do they? Yes, which is brilliant. And she is seen as one of them. And, and so, so, just in terms of how cohesive this is, we've talked a lot about the Conservative Party being five different parties, like mm. the ERG, the New Conservatives, mm. and so on, all sort of held together like a big jelly. The Labour Party isn't that dissimilar, is it? And, no, and, and they are all. trying to put on a united front, but it's not that united. No, it's not that united, but, I mean, certainly, I mean, I'm aware of certain figures, let's just say, who see the S- even the SCG, the Socialist Campaign Group, as not being left enough. OK, so yes, there are just as many factions uh, on the left. What you also have is a lot of people who've been kicked out of the Labour Party because Starmer hasn't followed the Kinnock containment strategy where he just got rid of some of them but kept the rest of them in their subs and then they could go and put their silly policies on the floor of conference and then get soundly defeated. But what he's done is kicked out now over 90,000 people who are now wishing to work with the don't pay people. That's another 250,000. You could end up with a, a left-wing vote split at the election because they're now trying to form a new party, which will counter the right-wing split between the Tories and Reform. Well, might not have much time. No. <laughs> well, might not have much time. When, so, so just on that, um, uh, Rishi Sunak is, is, is hoping for a stroke of luck. Things seem to be turning, i.e. inflation coming down. For example, he's really hoping that that will happen. Also, the safety of Rwanda bill, of course, mm. that returns this week. Yes. We think that will go through maybe Wednesday, Thursday mm-hmm. of this week. He's desperate for some really good news. But but actually, what, what I think is fascinating about this, we'll talk about this in a minute, about the ECHR. What do you make of his, the, the fact that he seems to be changing his tack about the ECHR, this new ruling about the fact you have a right to family life and the fact the government should protect you from climate change? Well, I would say that it looks to me as though he's realising that it, it, his former position is not working and it's not going to work and that, and that without doing something about the, the ECHR, the policies he wants to get through are not going to work either. And I think this is a realisation that probably had, had been coming for some time. But then when the increased pressure comes back, he's probably also looked at the, the sheer extent of the amendments and the pressure from the Lords and thought, oh, God, you know. And, and if he did say, right, we're leaving the ECHR, would that change the Conservatives' fortunes? Be for the electorate to decide. Um, I, th- I think, I'll tell you what, I think a lot of that's going to depend on how he presents it. You know, if well, it, taking back control, the UK being in charge. Yeah, as opposed to we don't care about humanitarian rights anymore. You know, so so and uh, very quickly, if I can, because time is tight. But I just want to say, Tim Loughton is standing down as well. This is sixty-four Conservative MPs now mm. saying they're standing down. That's kind of reading the writing on the wall, isn't it? And um, there, there's also another great story that's happening, which is Suella Braverman is talking yep. at uh, this. What the the um, I believe this is the Guardian saying is a far-right convention 
in Brussels. Well, in fact, would. I'm in Brussels tomorrow, and this oh. convention is taking place at the same time. This is the National Conservatism NatCon conference in Brussels this week. It's controversial because people like Viktor Orban are speaking. Hans George Masson, the former German spy chief, uh, who uh, has been quite controversial. So there are lots of people speaking at NatCon uh, in Brussels. And I'm not sure Sunat will be that happy with Braverman doing that. Well, uh, what I was thinking when I read this story was, you know, the, what he needs like a hole in the head right now is to look weak. So if he tells her not to go, because he's being encouraged apparently to tell her not to go, well, how is he going to do that? It'll be in some sort of letter or whatever, which will inevitably get leaked to the press. She'll go anyway. And then he will just look. He will have lost even more authority. Also, she she's not on his payroll mm. anymore. She's not in the government. And she's free to express her view. Yes, she is. I mean, you couldn't stop Nadine Doris going to the jungle. You couldn't stop Matt, ha Matt Hancock <laughs> going to the to the forest. Uh, the well, you're was. right. So the Shadow Paymaster General, Jonathan Ashworth, has written to the Prime Minister saying you cannot allow her to speak at that conference. I mean, I'm sorry. I think free speech is really important. I also think he's in a different party, so maybe he should butt out. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're right. Well, and actually, I think that's a very valid point because the fact that he's in a different party and doesn't want her to speak says that he knows she's going to speak to the people. Mm. Mm be fascinating to see what happens quite by accident i'm in brussels but anyway i'm not i'm not going to that conference. we'll believe you yeah well absolutely patrick really good to talk to you thank you very much thank indeed you very patrick much. tim's there good. editor of wolves of westminster right time for a break keep all of your messages uh coming in i just will read this ian says another beautiful morning here in norfolk Happy uh, good morning to you in Norfolk. Complimented by the blooming presenters on Talk TV. Um, here, uh, before I, we're talking about David's comments, before I start my gardening, may I say here, here to David's views on ridding us of these pathetic politicians. Let's start with you two wonderful people. We, your devoted audience, have been saying you two should be running the country for ages now. And what can we do to make that happen? I think we need to have a coup. Great show, as always. Well, thank you very much indeed for that. So we're running the country next. Right, if it's done by coup, does that mean I I don't have to go out canvassing. Yes. Excellent. There you are. I'm all in. <laughs> all right. Uh, thank you very much. Keep all your messages uh, coming in after the break. It's time for our future politics panel. This is Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And you're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from King City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, yeah. minutes, four... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. 
the UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, 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 did fail her. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Back to Weekend Breakfast, uh, I'm David Bull, the time 8.27 now on Sunday, April the 14th. Dr. Rene is in the house as well, having fun? Yes, yeah, always. Always good, yeah, yeah. very pleased. Uh, lots of messages coming in as well. Uh, we're asking this morning, how worried are you about the escalation in the Middle East? The number 03444991000. You can WhatsApp us as well to the same number. You can also text us, text the word talk and your message to 8722. You can also X us uh, at Talk TV, leave a space, then a hashtag breakfast doctors. Anything? This is an interesting one, so mm. if you think about this, Charlie B says, has Rishi played a blinder by not calling an early GE general, general election? election. Um, if World War Three breaks out, there will be no election. I'm not sure that's a blinder, is it? <laughs> <laughs> no. I mean, it is interesting, actually, as to the timing of that election. Everyone is saying October. October I'm, 17th. I don't know. I don't know. It could be January. Although then you'd campaign over Christmas and no one would like that. No one would like with sherry that. sherry and mince pies and campaigning, which you would hate. I would absolutely. It <laughs> should be illegal. <laughs> it should be illegal. Keep all of these uh, messages uh, coming in. Um, now, this is, this is also interesting. I've heard it before. This is Tim Pettiford in Nelson, in North Somerset. Good morning, all. Great show. Thank, uh, you. thank you very much. The great Nostradamus once predicted that a third war will start in the Middle East. I've heard this before. He's been right with a lot of predictions. Hopefully, this one isn't one of them. Mm -hmm. I hope so, Let's hope so, too. It's a really good point, though. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, this one says, I'm more worried uh, about the war that is happening in our country. Well, it's interesting you say that, because actually the tenor of all of my um, tweets this morning to Breakfast Doctors it's along the lines of what Robert says. Morning dynamic duo, we can't do anything about situations abroad. However, we have a frightening problem within the enemies within our own country. Police and politicians seem hapless and helpless in stemming the racist and anti-Semitic thugs on our streets mm. every weekend. Mm. We've heard it repeatedly, haven't repeatedly we? Repeatedly this morning. Single, that is what's coming in. Every single weekend. Keep all of your messages coming in, please. But now it's time for the Future Politics Panel. <laughs> The Future Politics Panel. Uh, joining us this morning, I'm delighted to say Grace Badamosi and also Alex uh, Petropoulos, uh, who joins us for the very first time. Do you want to move that mic slightly toward... Ooh, uh, slightly toward... That was a bit, bit, uh, bit rough. Nice to see you both. How are you? Nice to see Good. you. Thank you for having us on today. Oh, no, absolute yeah. pleasure. You look absolutely fabulous, Thank Grace. You, you look like you're going out after Thank this. You. Are you it's going out? You? No. Oh. No, I'm going back to bed after this, actually. Oh, right. <laughs> it's a beautiful day outside. Yes, absolutely. Right, shall we, shall we start with um, the news that has been breaking overnight. You know, the front page actually of only one paper at the moment. Uh, Iran launches swarm of kamikaze drones at Israel. This is Iran launching an unprecedented attack on Israel, unleashing a barrage of missiles, rockets and drones from its own territory and from its proxies across the Middle East. US and British forces reportedly intercepted more than 100 drones after hundreds were launched from Iran in a long-awaited attack after weeks of threats from Tehran. Iranian state television said ballistic missiles missiles have been launched in a joint assault designed to overwhelm Israeli air defences deep in the occupied territories. That's been confirmed by the IDF. Uh, the army is urging residents of various parts of Israel to stay near protective uh, spaces. And we also saw these um, drones and rockets coming from the Iranian proxy groups in Lebanon, Iraq, Syria and Yemen. Now, Grace, we knew this was coming. Uh, Joe Biden warning uh, Iran, do not attack Israel, saying the support for Israel is ironclad. A, a change of kind of language from the United States. The, the US intelligence was right. It said that uh, there was going to be an attack. The USA said it would stand by them. This is all, and, and it was, we were talking to Roger Gawalb earlier. He, I think he put this really well into context 
context, this is also about the attack on Israel. Israel then uh, attacked on the 1st of April. They struck against uh, Iran's consulate in Syria, killing a senior commander of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard called Mohammad Reza uh, Zahidi. And, it, and, and Iran said, look, we aren't going to respond. We knew it was coming. What do you make of, of what happened and the fact that Iran itself was involved, which I think took many analysts by surprise? Yeah, this is firstly an incredibly worrying escalation in the region. And the fact that, as you said, Iran did actually conduct the attacks itself really shows the kind of heightening tensions. I think what we really need to look at is what Israel's response is going to be after the fact. Because as you mentioned, they bombed the consulate in Syria. Um, Iran then conducted its sort of response over the night. What we really need to look at is, thankfully, 99%, I think, of those drones were intercepted. So it now kind of eyes are on Israel to see what its response is going to be, whether that's going to be de-escalating or, you know, sort of going like for like. I think at the end of the day, from what the US has said and from what the UK has done, it seems that the international community is kind of rallying around Israel on this. So Very much yeah. so. What's your take on it, Alex? I'd have to agree with what Grace is saying. I think that... You know, there are lots of people that are pushing for a de-escalation. There are lots of people that are pushing for, that are trying to prevent essentially World War Three from happening. Mm. And there are a lot of people trying really hard to do that, but there are also some people who are actively working against that. And so, to, I, I do think that Israel will probably de-escalate. I don't think it has the ability, it doesn't have the space, it doesn't have the bandwidth to open a new front to start and, 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 and if it does do that, does it then assume the moral high ground of saying, OK, and in fact, those those strikes were very targeted. In fact, the damage is, is, is minimal. Mm -hmm. and, and I think Israel, we knew it was coming, but Israel's the response has has been quite precise. If there had been collateral damage, if people had been killed in that strike, there is no doubt Israel would have responded. Yeah, and it's all about proportional response, right? Which is so Israel did its uh, attack on that general, and now Iran does what it, it sees as a proportional response. And you know, I think that we have to say that Israel disproportionately responded to the Hamas attack. In hindsight, it responded in an excessive manner and killed many civilians. So the track record doesn't look that great there. Well, Maybe it will well, have to, learned well to be fair to Israel, 1,200 people were killed, we had all the hostages taken, and Israel then responded. But, but many people share your view, which is that actually Israel's response has been, has been more uh, in terms of Gaza. And of course, you're seeing all these displaced mm. people in Gaza, the push for the two-state solution. These two parties are miles apart in terms of any mediation, despite all these other countries getting involved. As a, as a young person, mm. though... How concerned are you about, and we talked about Nostradamus actually, how concerned are you this is going to escalate into something resembling a third world war? Just absolutely terrified. Uh, honestly, absolutely terrified. I mean, firstly, when sort of Ukraine and Russia broke out, we were all talking about energy prices and prices mm -hmm. then. If we see a conflict break out in the region, the economic impacts alone are going to be absolutely massive. Now to talk of the actual conflict, once... Uh, because Iran actually conducted this attack itself, and depending on what Israel's re response is going to be, we could very well see a situation where NATO countries like the US, like the UK, are going to get involved in the conflict. And this is going to sort of trickle down into, again, tensions within the UK. Mm. And Alex, uh, for you, um, as, as a young person as well, mm. how concerned are you? I, I think I share Grace's concern. You know, when, when Germany invaded Poland and when Japan invaded China, no one thought that that would become a world war no one saw that as for what it would be mm. and we have to be very careful when these small regional conflicts can blow up into these wider escalations that being said like, like i said before there are lots of people working really hard to make sure that doesn't happen i think that we should keep putting our backs behind and our, our support behind those people we should keep throwing criticism at people who try to undermine global security people who want to undermine western alliances Lots of people, maybe people who are getting elected in this wave of elections this year, who'd be trying to stoke up nationalist uh, that, politics. That's a really interesting point, isn't it, about the fact that we are about to see enormous numbers of elections around the world. And of course, destabilisation of the, of the West would be key to that. Well, I was just wondering, Alex, listen to you, um, just how does Starmer handle this? Because he already has a problem within his party for the um, pro-Palestine supporters, the anti-Israel supporters. Now he's going to have to come out, I assume, with all the Western leaders and supporters. He, uh, he has yeah. actually yeah. already said so that he does support them. So how does that them. play for him? 
You're right, this is a very different, difficult balancing act that he's going to have to manage. That being said, he's already doing the right things. He's already committed to that 2.5% spending for defence. When that comes is difficult to tell because there are a lot of other problems that the country has to be facing before you can get to fixing defence, and that's a whole... You know, there's so much wrong that you have to really tackle everything from all angles. I think that you can really focus on really focusing on the, this idea that we're just trying to keep peace, we're trying to maintain peace, and that's a consistent message across both Israel defending itself and keeping Palestinian civilians. But, but the really interesting point about that, and, Corb, um, and Corbyn and, and, and Starmer, of course, Starmer was on Corbyn's side, who mm. obviously didn't want to have any deterrent. Now he's changed completely to saying we need to spend 2.5% of GDP on defence. This yeah. is about him trying to look prime ministerial. Meanwhile, we've got the Corbynistas thinking, well, actually, uh, we can amass around this. Is, is Starmer actually... I mean, do you believe what Starmer says? Well, firstly, with Israel, I think Starmer's change has started about 17 times mm -hmm. since the conflict actually broke out. And I don't think anyone can actually trust anything that he says because he's saying one thing today and, like, next week it'll be something different. And you're right, he does have a really serious issue mm -hmm. in the party of people who are wrongly conflating criticism of Israel's conduct in the conflict with somehow supporting the Iranian regime. So I think Starmer definitely is trying to position himself to look somewhat prime ministerial, but I, I don't think it's working. Interesting. And of course, Angela Rayner, this bubbles along, and now we've got the latest, <laughs> the former employee. This is Matt Finnegan. And Angela Rayner is saying, well, this was my primary residence in one, one, in one of the properties, and then it turns out that it may well be the other one. She registered the children at the other one. She made £48,500. Now, Matt Finnegan says he's in no doubt a former aide that a resident um, Miss Rena shared with her husband was the family home. So so where does this go from here? Does that change things for Starmer? Because he's going to have to decide, does he actually side with Angela Rena? And he's being very measured in his language. Or does he side with her? Or does he sort of try and distance himself as this unravels? I think that Starmer has been very correct and he's actually succeeded a lot in keeping party unity together that's been his main goal throughout the whole thing he's kept his party together he's created this broad tent i think he's going to stand behind reina i think it's the right thing to do i think that even if she's to be honest even if she's even if she's law. even if she's broken the law this happened before she was an mp it doesn't I really... matter. It doesn't matter. She, if she breaks electoral law and she's going to be deputy prime minister, you don't think that matters? I, I believe in second chances. I believe people can make mistakes. But this isn't just Sorry, a second chance, yeah. really, is it? I mean, she once called all Tories scum. I mean, yeah. she's not... Well, she, and she, she attacked Jill Mortimer, for example, in Hartlepool. She called for Akshata Murthy to publish her tax returns. So it does rather stink of hypocrisy, yeah. doesn't it? I do think you're right that Starmer is going to stand behind Angela Rayner. I don't I'm think not that's the right... Th Honestly, no, I, th I'm I think not. he will really? flip-flop and I think by the but end of next week... That's going to be a hard thing to like do in the media. He does it all the time. Yeah. Yeah. But also, if he flip-flops again, that's a gift to the Conservative Party, yeah. isn't it? Because they're already calling him Captain Flip-flop. Watch his language. So he, he doesn't have 100% confidence. He now mm. has full confidence. By next week, he might have a bit of confidence. <laughs> I, I'm just not... I, I just don't know that he'll stick to that I think th that today's line. revelation with the aid coming out is yeah. going to make him think long and hard now, what do I do, what do I do? And I'm actually not sure he wants Angela Ray. Now, I think he was always forced to have her. I and agree. I think this might be his opportunity to get rid of her. But if he gets rid of her, then th then I think there's more. there are more problems brewing, mm. aren't there? Yeah, I think Angela Rayner was really someone he had to endure in the party yeah. to kind of keep certain factions of the Labour Party happy. So if she does end up sort of resigning, either if she's found to have broken the law or if Starmer gets rid of her, it's going to be interesting to see how the party... So, so then the question is, Alex, is, is Rayner an asset for Starmer or a liability? It's a very good question. I think she's an asset for the people that matter. I think that for these young voices who are maybe feeling a bit disenfranchised by some of the moves that they've seen Keir Starmer make, she's a definite asset. Yeah. I think that for people who don't care about that, to be honest, I don't think this story is landing. To be honest, I don't think they really give a fuss about this and I think they're going to be vo voting Labour regardless. At the end of the day, I think that so for, for that one group that cares, an asset for that one group that doesn't care, whatever. We shall see. Right, let's take a break. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much indeed, Alex and Grace, for uh, the moment. Time for a break. We'll continue with our Future Politics panel after this break. Don't go anywhere. This is Talk TV. Very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. 
Now, you ain't Talk. going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of Cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss him. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just yeah. for... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read a statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail her. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Morning. We're in the middle of future politics panel. Grace Badamosi, Alex Petropoulos uh, joining us this morning. Let's uh, move on. I just want to read one out. Uh, this is interesting. We were talking about this in the break. If Labour wins the election and the far left are plotting to hijack the Labour Party, as the front page headline suggests, an extreme far left prime minister could be a reality and Britain will never recover. I'm, I'm aiming that at Alex. Right, let's move on. <laughs> and talk about the ECHR. So, obviously, we've been talking about the safety of Rwanda Bill. It's coming back. We believe it will go through on Wednesday or Thursday of this week, of course. Uh, the safety of Rwanda Bill is interesting because, obviously, uh, it sets out the criteria and what it says, and obviously we're now in parliamentary ping-pong. But Rishi Sunak, the ECHR, there's been another ruling. Rishi Sunak has hit out at the complete overreach of an illegitimate ruling by the European Court of Human Rights that imposes a duty on governments, wait for this, to achieve net zero. Now, this is an intervention from Downing Street, which comes ahead of the Safety of Rwanda bill. And, and this essentially is, is the most extraordinary judgment, as far as I can see. So, the ECHR ruled the human rights of a group of elderly Swiss women had been violated by the failure of their government to act quickly enough to tackle climate change. Many cabinet ministers completely overwhelmed by that ruling, basically saying, here we go, yet again, a foreign court interfering. Now, I can also share that a man who lost his Norfolk home to North Sea coastal erosion, which happens all the time, by the way, in this country, then is suing the government for not doing enough on global warming based on the ECHR decision. Surely that means we need to leave, doesn't it, Grace? 
Well, firstly, I'm an absolute advocate of staying in the ECHR. <laughs> I know that. Um, <laughs> it was primarily created by Brits, and there's not really anything in it that contradicts British law. Talking on specifically... Well, Steve Barkley, the Environment Secretary, said human rights do not start with the ECHR, and they do not end with the ECHR. But there's nothing in the ECHR that contradicts what is in British law. Um, and talking specifically on net zero, again, you know, I'm a big fan of that. Uh, Again, uh, this... Hang ruling... on a minute. So you've got the ECHR saying, basically, we the government is responsible for mm. getting to net but zero. This has and that somehow already. stops coastal this erosion. Is, this has happened in Britain already. The UK government has been sued and lost by British advocacy groups who said that the British government is failing in its commitments to net zero that it made. Who voted it was for that? But the... Who voted for net zero? It's not a thing that you vote for. Well, like, why not? It because it... Of course it is, Grey. Having a concern for the environment and I'm saying I'm concerned that about the environment. I don't think this arbitrary target is, is right. Firstly, it's not an arbitrary it target. It is completely it's, it's what quite is it? literally... What is it based on? The, it's based on scientific research. Have you watched the says, climate the movie? No. Perhaps you should. OK. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll add it to my watching list. Yes, do. But um, in terms of net zero, the UK government has, again, it's nothing to do with the ECHR. The UK government has been sued by UK advocacy groups and UK talking, courts and lost. I am talking about the ECHR finding mm. the Swiss state had breached Article 8 of the ECHR, which yeah. guarantees the right to respect for private and family life. Now, it's a binding convention because we're signatories to this, but we've even got a British judge who says, um, I fear in this judgment the majority has gone beyond what is legitimate and permissible for the court to do. Unfortunately, in doing so, may well have achieved exactly the opposite effect to what was intended. Now, I think that's really pertinent because, actually, I think this is going to embolden Sunak to say, right, enough is enough, we're out. Alex? So, yes, I think that might be the case. To be honest, I'm not opposed to leaving the ECHR for the right reason. See, Grace? <laughs> I do think that the Rwanda bill is an absolutely ridiculous and terrible reason I agree on to, that. to leave. And I think that, honestly, the climate stuff also doesn't really make much sense because, like Grace says, we already have our own domestic laws that cover all of this stuff. The yeah. sues happen regardless. You know, if it's stopping the government doing something that would make the country better, leave. But if And so if someone wants to make that case to me, definitely. So, so Renny, can I just ask you, so there's this chap, Kevin Jordan, he's 70, he says he's lost everything after sea erosion saw his home in Hemsby near Great Yarmouth demolished by the local council. And this is because, basically, they're suing the government, but he had a house on, basically, a part of land where we know coastal erosion takes place. Yes, yeah, we are an island. There and will always be coastal erosion. That's how the land has been formed. Um, this is like buying a house next to a nightclub and then complaining that you don't like noise, I'm afraid. It's very sad. And I feel sorry for him, of course, for anyone that loses anything. What worries me more here is courts ruling on ideologies, because it is an ideology. It's not an ideology. It's an ideology. It's, an ideology. it's, an ideology. it's actually entirely devoid of an opinion. It is very simply the fact saying, if we don't take specific action by right. a specific okay. date... You know what, Grace? Okay. It is an ideology, okay. because what's happening here is we're hearing the same <laughs> sentences that we've heard for trans that we've heard for covid which is 99 percent of scientists agree with this well actually if you actually dig a little bit deeper into that kind of statement and look where the money goes when you're a scientist and all of your funding will only come if you do the right kind of science or the right kind of research you will go along with the narrative grace is giving you a with yeah, 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 she might well <laughs> we saw it in covid we've seen it in mm. trans we're seeing it again now in climate you should watch climate the movie it's on netflix it's been squashed every Everywhere because it doesn't go with the, the, with the creativity. Things like um, special weather events, coastal erosion, rising water. There's lots and lots of science that says that the net zero policy is utter and complete nonsense. Sorry. Watch it <laughs> and then come back I to disagree. Me. Uh, you will be hard pressed to find any credible scientist okay, shall I that you? actually believes right. net zero Grace, isn't something Grace. the government's needs All to of the scientists to. in there, there was one of them who's a Nobel Peace Prize winner in I'm, physics. I, can, 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 let, let you, you two can take this outside. <laughs> Alex, can I just ask you, though, um, we're now seeing other countries saying, actually, we, we are thinking of leaving the ECHR, including Switzerland. And, and obviously, this is more a right of centre, it's a right wing mm -hmm. Swiss party. 
party SVP saying we need to leave the ECHR. This, I think, is overreach. I just want to go back to the point I asked Grace. Who voted for net zero? And when you tell me, when you tell me this is all made in science and these, these deadlines are set, because, by the way, they changed them. It was 2050, now it's 2035, based on absolutely no more data. But, but in terms of people's voting, let me just tell you what's going on in my neck of the woods. So, so essentially, National Grid wants to build pylons and lay cables as part of Norwich, Norwich, North Norfolk, down to Tilbury in Essex. And essentially, no one's been asked about this to connect wind farms to the grid, marching great big blinking pylons across great... Tilbury is already quite ruined by pylons, actually. Tilbury is, but what about Norfolk, Suffolk? Mm. And obviously, I'm speaking because I'm a yeah. NIMBY and I don't want pylons in my backyard. <laughs> I want to know, shouldn't we have a referendum on net zero? No pylons. So I, I'm actually going to disagree with you for the, for the reason... <laughs> I'm not surprised. But, but for a reason you might not expect, I actually agree with you that net zero is a bit silly and setting this arbitrary target. Oh, no. Arbitrary. Arbi Come but, on. I, arbitrary. but I do think we need substantial climate action. I do think we need to do things like building pylons. So what matters isn't setting these arbitrary targets and then saying, it's I don't care how you get... No, because this is important, because we, okay. we don't have a way to get there. We, we set, Theresa May said, this is how we, we're going to stop all climate emissions by this date but then didn't set out a plan to actually get there. And the problem is that this allows politicians to shield themselves from actually doing something about the problem. You know, it's cheaper to build a wind farm, it's cheaper to build a solar farm in the country than it is to build a gas power plant, but we're not allowed to build it because the planning regulations say that if one person objects to your onshore wind farm, it's blocked. If one person objects to your grid connector, well, it's also if one person blocked. objects to you fracking, it's blocked. That goes both ways. We, we should we, we should reform both. Honestly, okay. we should just have lots more energy production Good. throughout the whole country. I agree. Yes, I agree, I agree with that. And, and also, I think that's a really important. Uh, point, which is uh, about the arbitrary targets, Grace. <laughs> this is 120 miles. What the government says, we have been very clear on targets for connecting large amounts of offshore wind. If we pause it, we would miss our target. It's a made-up target. It's not a made-up target. <laughs> it's it like, I just, I don't understand this idea that it's a made-up target. We set they a made it up. We set a deadline <laughs> saying that if we don't So they have, made it up? Okay, so right. I say, if I don't leave for my train by eight, I'm missing my train. That's not an arbitrary target. The train is leaving whether I'm Rubbish on it or example. not. The same, way, the same way that regardless of whether we, you know, build onshore and offshore wind farms, there is going to be a point where climate change is irreversible. So Chris That's and Newbury, an Chris and Newbury says okay. Grace proves net zero yeah. is a religion because she hasn't read How anything. How is it a religion? That, hang on a minute, hasn't read anything that contradicts the opinion yeah. of the believers. Okay. Is she too afraid it might dent her belief system if she sees evidence uh, that... Can I ask you uh, one uh, question? Do you believe that carbon dioxide is causing the weather to change? Uh, carbon dioxide is somewhat damaging to the environment. Is it? Yes. Do you know um, what levels Trees of carbon like dioxide it. we are at now compared with um, 40,000 years ago, compared the, to the temperature? Off the top of my head, no. Why don't you know this data when you're arguing so hard for it? Because I don't need to know specific data I know the data because specific... I'm arguing against it. Please tell me. Please okay, tell so me. we were in an ice age, but we had 2,000 parts per million, but now we've only got 400 and our temperatures are rising. At the end of the day, we can all see, I whether you agree with me or not, we can all see how can climate we? change is irreversibly damaging our natural environment. because I'm looking at the data. I'm looking out outside. I'm looking at the fact that my children, my children's children, won't be able to have a secure Do you think future. I don't love my children? Uh, That's literally right, okay. not what I'm saying. I, 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 Oh, you're, you're on fire <laughs> this morning, Doctor. Um, Alex, ju just, ju just in terms of where we go from here, mm. and, and look, I also want to move to a greener, more sustainable future. It's yes, just, that's right. It, it's, it's just, I mean, I drive an electric car, for example, but I don't want to do it and, and actually hamper the progress of this country, and that's why, actually, I think fracking is part of the solution. I think nuclear, we should have built nuclear power stations many, many years ago. We talked about it 20, 25 years ago. We just didn't do it. Yeah, I agree. I, I think we need to build all of that. And I think that, like we said, getting a bit lost in when we're going to get there uh, gets us lost to how we're going to get there. I think that, to be honest, a lot of climate politics comes down to vibes more than actual... <laughs> Uh, comes down to vibes and you know the, that commenter said it was a religion he's in right and so far as that you know it, it is vibes based it is do people feel like they're doing the right thing for the environment when actually there might be if you look at the actual figures there might be things that actually work better for the environment um 
very quickly, I'm just going to read you a comment here. Good morning, doctors. Great show as always. These young people haven't got a clue about <laughs> net zero and climate change. I feel so sorry for them. They have a lot to learn. Francis and Arundel, thank you very much indeed. Let me just ask you very quickly, if I may. I think time is quite tight. I want to talk about um, missed appointments in, in the health service because mm. a lot of missed appointments. I was just looking. We had 124 million outpatient appointments across the uh, NHS in England last year. Six, eight million, eight million DNA. That means do not attend. Um, and this costs the NHS about 1.2 billion quid every single year. If you miss your appointment, should we fine you? Do you know what? I'm actually not against this. I feel like if you can prove you had a valid reason for um, missing your appointment, absolutely the fine should be waived. But the NHS is already on its knees, as we all know, and its resources are being stretched like far beyond its capability. So if we can put a financial incentive for people to you know not skip these appointments that other people desperately need i'm all for it it's the problem alex that we we don't have a sense of value because it's free which it isn't it's free at the point of need and so people just think well i'm not going to turn up it, it is right that making a fine would make people show up more and i think that it's definitely one thing you can do i think it should be done alongside lots of other reforms <laughs> i think there's a big danger of if you just grab onto this one thing say this is my silver bullet i'm just mm. going to make people pay it's a, it could be a slippery slope, it could end up with lots of bad things happening. At the end of the day, we have to have a conversation about our NHS and say, look, things will have to change. Things will have to maybe get a bit worse in some parts in order for the system as the whole to get better. Yeah. We can't stick to this ideological... Yeah. I think we Security. all agree. I think yeah. we all agree. Very quickly, if I may, uh, there is a billionaire who has a plan to bring Titanic back to life. Uh, this has been rumbling on for a long time. This is Clive Palmer. He loved the movie of Titanic. I just wonder if he recreates Titanic, which essentially would be 56,000 tonnes, it would be wider, it would have modern safety standards, it would also have lifeboats and everything. And it wouldn't hit an iceberg? It wouldn't hit an iceberg. <laughs> I, I, is that in bad taste? I mean, I've, I've always been fascinated by Titanic. Is it in bad yeah. taste? I just think it's a bit of an odd thing to do, I'll be honest. I, I think if you're a billionaire, clearly you've got a bit of spare cash lying around. I personally wouldn't be sort of recreating a mass grave, but if it works for you, I guess. He could maybe feed the children in Yemen that are suffering mm. from famine. Or the children in this country suffering <laughs> uh, from hardship. What do you think? I think uh, it's very important for people to do cool and weird things. <laughs> I think, I, so I totally agree. I think that the world it's needs more people doing, <laughs> doing weird and honestly, it's often, it sometimes comes to billionaires to do weird things boys are talking. that no. other people wouldn't do. And, uh, you know, I think society benefits from I it. totally agree. I think this is a rational, very intelligent conversation as opposed to what was going on <laughs> over there. Uh, thank you very much to, to both you. of you, to Grace Badamosi, Alex Petropolis. Thank you very much indeed for coming in. That was today's Future Politics Panel. The Future Politics Panel. So we're approaching uh, nine o'clock now. Nine o'clock is our health hour. If you need any help with any medical problems, please do get in touch and we can give you uh, the benefit of our advice. Also, we're going to be talking about a number of other things uh, this morning. We're going to be talking about migraine, a brand new treatment as well that's been authorised. So keep all of those messages coming. And we're going to be talking also about some of the latest health news as well. That's all still to come. But if you want your medical problems answered, please get in touch. You know exactly how to do that. We'll also be telling you why you shouldn't drink diet sodas. This is Talk TV. This is Talk TV. This, my friends, is Talk Today with me, Jeremy Kyle. And me, Nicola Thorpe. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, Oi, oi, treat, go. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman, trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. 
and yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Worm is it? There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on mm. the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans. Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. We're yeah, supposed it was another era. That. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Look, I'm getting ready for my new primetime show on talk TV and radio, 7 o'clock Saturday night, James Whale Unleash. I don't need you coming in here, following me around with a cat. I'm so sorry about this. Saturdays at 7 on talk TV. Hello, everyone. Good morning to you. It's just after 9 o'clock now on Sunday, April the 14th. I'm David Bull. This is uh, Weekend Breakfast. Thank you very much indeed for your company. If you have just joined us, we have great news for you uh, this morning. It is National Dolphin Day, a day which <laughs> recognises them, those intelligent social animals, uh, mammals of the water. Uh, so National Dolphin Day today. It's also Reach As High As You Can Day. <laughs> It's a day to expand your horizons and try to attain that dream that seems so hard and so far to reach. Also, happy birthday to former star of Doctor Who and star of The Thick of It. Yeah, happy birthday, Peter Capaldi. He turns a very youthful 66 today. Now, he's also a distant relative of singer Louis Capaldi. He is also uh, has Italian citizenship. And as I keep saying, these Italians get everywhere, don't they, Gabriella, my lovely producer? Right, uh, let's move on to today. Today's fascinating facts. Today's fascinating facts. So, Doctor. Right. Right. I found the date. Shall we have a microphone? Oh, oh, you got one on. Yeah, yeah sorry. <laughs> um, oh, it's all right. I'm having a senior moment. You really are. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I have remembered these because I quite like the dates for some reason oh, this morning. Okay. 1912 yes. was obviously the sinking of the Titanic. Yes. It happened at midnight and it sunk in the early hours. Yes, how many people were killed? 1,500. Yeah, amazing, isn't it? Yeah. Awful. I mean, funny that we've just been talking about it. 1931 was the first ever highway code. Uh, yes. Yes? Yes. And I think people... Would I was do... just thinking, it's not funny we talked about the Titanic. It was carefully crafted by my good self Oh, this sorry. Yeah, Pardon what... me. It wasn't a coincidence. No, it really wasn't. OK. Yeah. Just... Uh, well just... done, David. Yeah, thank you. That's what I wanted. <laughs> right. Next. Now, shall I say the next one again, then? 1931, yeah. 1931 The Highway Code yeah. was published for the first time. And I would suggest that some people could do well to read it today. <laughs> a lot of people, actually. And then 1983... Yep. 
Oh my goodness, it's gone out of my No, but I remember this so vividly. The first, the first cordless telephone. Yes, exactly. So uh, the first cordless telephone capable of operating up to 600 feet. It was a huge thing. It was a huge thing. Huge. Yeah, from base was introduced. It was I made by... I trialled one of those first phones called a rabbit phone. Uh, you see, I kind of remember and that. And I had to drive around the countryside and find a rabbit sign over a shop and... From Isn't there, I could make a call within 100 metres. Isn't that amazing? And then, yeah, that's right, the first cordless <laughs> telephone capable of operating. Uh, 600 feet from base was introduced. It was made by Fidelity and British Telecom, and it sold for a walloping £170. Very good that indeed. That would have been a lot of money then. It was a lot of money. Yeah. Those were today's fascinating facts. <laughs> Um, I want to talk about lots of, uh, this is our medical hour, and it I is. want to talk about lots of uh, medical hour. Now, we've been talking about xylazine, which is this zombie drug. I think we spoke about it briefly last it came week. came from China, originally. Did it? I yes. didn't know that. Um, but people using cannabis, THC vapes, risk inhaling a really dangerous substance called xylazine. This is according to UK experts. So what we're essentially seeing, we're seeing this xylazine appearing in all sorts of different products. This is a sedative which is used in veterinary medicine it's designed to put big animals like cows and horses to sleep it can be pretty lethal for humans and yes. uh, and the real concern here is it's it's uh, what they call a snidey drug it, it's appearing yeah. in other in other medications as a contaminant yeah and there has been one death i believe so far from it as That's a right. contaminant in the uk i mean this is really worrying and again it goes back to knowing what you're putting into your body where it comes from and Absolutely. how decent it is and and xylazine again we talked about you know we you and I have talked uh, repeatedly about the classification of drugs in this country, and actually, it's based on quite spurious science. You'll never keep up with it. Xylazine, when I looked earlier in the week, isn't even included in the no. classification of because drugs. Because it's a manufactured substance. Exactly. So yeah. now the UK Advisory Council has recommended to the government that it becomes a Class C drug, which I found quite interesting. Which And uh, it goes back to those classes. They may, they're not related to any sort of clinical parameters. They're based on law. Yeah, they're based on law and the law isn't working. I think that's the most important thing. I mean, we've got, we talked about this the other day. We suddenly, in the NHS, we have drugs that we can prescribe that are suddenly reclassified mm. as controlled drugs and we're no longer to put them on certain prescriptions. And it, as you rightly say, it changes all the time. And you're, you're right to ask the question, David. Why? Mm. What what has decided? What what are the parameters? And and I uh, you know and, and we saw that from uh, Professor David Nutt, for example, saying it's actually completely unfit for purpose. Now xylazine, we saw originally in the week, it, it's a cutting agent, and it was used with uh, fentanyl with heroin, for example. But the response, or, or certainly what it does, is it seems to cause necrotic lesions yeah. in the poor people using this. And it goes back to what you and I have spoken about: the war <coughs> on drugs will never be won because human beings are hardwired to take substances we saw that didn't so we? so let's move to a place where we can test drugs for people and at least know that what they are taking is not going to be necrotic to their liver Absolutely. or their brain or any other part of their body but i do think it's deeply concerning that if we're seeing these vapes um you know with xylazine in it it's it's, it's going to be a major problem and obviously they're keeping an eye out for that i wonder what you make of this because sexual health obviously we're seeing an explosion in sexual health uh diseases sexual uh sexually transmitted infections there's a, there's an article that i picked up this morning which is an early stage clinical trial has come back with promising results for a chlamydia vaccine and i imagine you have some quite strong feelings so i'm quite torn on this and i'll tell you for why so chlamydia is a horrible sexually transmitted disease for women because men very rarely get symptoms women sometimes get symptoms but what it does do every chlamydia infection that a woman gets reduces her fertility by 10 percent mm. it causes lesions along the fallopian tubes so that quite often ectopic pregnancies result after somebody's had chlamydia. So it is a devastated sexual mm. um, um, disease to get. Having said that, it's very easy to not get it. Um, <laughs> you know, use a condom. Mm. Don't sleep with somebody until they've had a um, sexual health check mm. and you too, so that you both know that you're clear. Obviously, that won't protect you if in between that the person you're having sex with goes off and does naughty things. Mm. But it's it, it's on the rise because we are being much more casual about the sex that we have. 
Uh, that's really interesting. Almost 200,000 cases were identified in England alone in 2022. That's an increase of 25%. Yeah. Uh, percent. And as you rightly say, it causes infertility and pelvic inflammatory disease as well. The other thing we don't talk about chlamydia, and it's because it doesn't really happen in this country, but the ophthalmology side of it, yes. so causing eye infections blindness. as well, with blindness, which you see in, in other countries, don't and you? And if you give birth when you've got a chlamydia infection, the baby gets eye disease. It's really a horrible, it's a horrible, but mm. not really that recognised or spoken about by young people. So then there's this suggestion, as you say, of a vaccine against mm. it. Now, at the moment, these trials are so early, David, they've only tested it on 150 yeah. people. Yeah. It's not powerful enough to actually show any side effects. And also, we don't know whether or not it actually stops the damage from infection or whether it just causes latent infection. I, indeed. But then, so so I, I share your worry about immunising people against uh, this chlamydia, for example. But equally, HPV, human papillomavirus, we immunise people against, don't we? Because, of course, the, re the response to CA cervix. So, so if, if you do have a vaccine, shouldn't you roll it out? Not not this early, no. No, not no. now. No, I mean if we get to the end of the clinical trials. Look, it should be an awful, but I think we need to get back to a point where people start taking responsibility for their own actions and I their would own agree. health. And every time we introduce a new medication to help them not do so, that... So let me ask you, why has it changed? Why has our, our sexual behaviour changed? I think we've just become more liberal as a society mm. and we have sexual health clinics and we have pills so women can have sex without worrying about mm -hmm. getting pregnant. We have terminations available. So all of the worries that women had are no longer there. That I'm not denouncing any of that, but I do think you have to think very, very carefully before you do things that could damage your health forever. I agree. It, it's interesting in, it, in terms of having sexual health clinics and also, but we don't see the advertising, and certainly when I was much younger... You well, know, and there we are far the, fewer numbers. It, well, and also we had the whole HIV uh, campaign that was waged at the time as well about safe sex and so on, and I think people did take that very seriously at the time. And it's interesting. Do you think we should have another campaign? I think we should have a big campaign so that women understand that if they get chlamydia, they are risking their future fertility, and they really are. Or ectopic pregnancies, which don't result in a live birth, obviously, because mm. they're dangerous to the woman and the child can't survive in the fallopian tube. Um, but I think we also need to teach people that they can avoid these infections as we use. So it's to. about responsibility. It is, and I think this is where sex education in schools should concentrate purely on sexual disease and sex education, not all the rest of it, not the, 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 ideology. the ideology. We need to teach children about safe sex and keeping themselves safe. We, we absolutely do, I couldn't agree more. Uh, let us know if you want some help with any medical problem. You can call us 0344 499 1000. You can also WhatsApp us as well. You can text the word talk in your message to 8722. You can also X us at Talk TV. I've got one here actually from John that's just come in. Uh, Dear doctors, uh, David and Rene, after an ECG, I've been diagnosed diagnosed with atrial ectopic heartbeat. Could you please explain this condition? Yeah, so I can because this is something, as David knows, that I've suffered with quite <laughs> yes, a lot. Yes, you have. I have. So um, lots of people get atrial ectopic beats and all it is is that there's a slight, the heart beats at a regular rate and then every now and again it takes a little bit longer to beat and so the heart fills up a little bit more than it would have and under the laws of physics it then beats much harder and quite often you feel that symptomatically and people mm. think that they're actually getting you know, um, heartbeats that are irregular. These ones are not irregular. Most people will have less than 0.5% of all of their heartbeats as ectopics. They usually go away when you exercise, which is a good sign. If they carry on through exercise, you really do need to speak to somebody about it. The only thing I'll say is that if you have a high proportion of ectopic beats, so say 5% of all of your beats are ectopic, it does put you at risk later on in life to get something called atrial fibrillation. So you do need to keep an eye on them and keep an eye on your heart health. Mm but they're completely benign normally. Mm. It's, it's really fascinating, isn't it? This is an interesting one. My son is self-medicating with T3 following months of lethargy, hunger yeah. and cold extremities. It's made an enormous difference to his life, but he doesn't know how to get NHS GPs to help him. What can we do to support him? Thank you, Anne, for that. It's a really interesting question. It's an interesting question. It doesn't quite make sense because if your son had hunger and weight loss and being, you know, that is actually looking at someone being hyperthyroid, i.e. too much thyroxine, mm. but then being lethargic, sleeping a lot and being cold is hypothyroid. So it doesn't quite make sense in terms of his And symptoms. also, well, I, I don't understand how he's self-medicating with T3 okay, if, so if, if there's been no diagnosis made either. Exactly. So I can answer that. You can buy this online. You can get it abroad quite but cheaply, Doesn't actually. this go back to you don't know what you're taking <clears> as well? 
it does. T3 is actually the active thyroid hormone. Most of our thyroid in the body is in the form of T4, which is inactive, and then the body breaks it down to T3 when it needs it. What I'm going to say is, is that your son using T3 without medical supervision is actually quite dangerous for his heart. Mm. It's actually a heart irritant. Now, I've been a supporter of T3 for the people that really need it. And I, at one point in my life, was taking it myself for my thyroid disease. I don't have a thyroid, um, but I don't take it anymore. It was irritating my heart too much. So can you please, please get your son to see an endocrinologist and they will diagnose him properly. And if he needs it, they can actually prescribe it on the NHS but it does need to be an endocrinologist. Uh, absolutely right and it needs to be done properly and through the right channels. Uh, lots of messages as well, you'll like this one, dear doctors please can you help a woman of 57, uh, can I start taking HRT? It's a really good question Jane, uh, Jane Brown there in Lincolnshire, thank you very much indeed. Definitely, the guidance actually on HRT and the NICE guidance from 2015 says that close to menopause is within 10 years, most women don't go through menopause till at least 51. Um, finishing their period so yes definitely you just need to see a doctor get them to do a risk assessment and talk you through the the pros and the cons uh, I'm just going to read this I'm sort of trying to read ahead hello you fabulous pair says Carol on WhatsApp <laughs> that's very you. nice I just want to give my grateful thanks to the lovely Rene who advised a caller the other week who has severe arthritis in the hip to try a steroid injection my ears pricked up I'm 78 and up until 2021 I was very fit healthy and active after the second Covid vaccine I'm now a shadow of my former self it started with an overactive thyroid. I now have Parkinson's and severe arthritis in the right hip. A few days ago, I had the injection and it was the best thing I have ever done. And I'm now looking forward to my cruise to the Canaries tomorrow, free of free of pain. Oh, That's absolutely brilliant. Fabulous. Once again, thank you so much. I love the both of you to bits. That's Carol in Newport. How thank lovely. Thank you and enjoy the cruise. Yes, I'm very jealous indeed. Uh, thank you very much. Also, uh, do get in touch if you want any uh, help uh, or advice. As you can see, you can message us, but you can also call uh, as well. I just want to go uh, on to a couple of more stories that I picked up. Um, diet soda. I have a bit of an issue with diet soda generally um, and I'm sure you do. We don't know a great deal about diet soda and I think people just reach for it because they think oh it's going to be better for me than having a full yeah. fat coke or whatever it yeah. is. But actually diet soda isn't, isn't innocuous no. is it? And it's not innocuous because of the way that your body views it. And that's what you must think about. What's happening when I put this into my stomach to the messaging that's going to my brain? And it is proven, actually, that when people that drink lots of diet soda, I think um, two, two litres a week, is that... Something the, like that, Something yeah. like that. Um, they actually are more obese because it changes the way that your body views your satiety point. That, that's so interesting. So, so people are saying, right, I'm going to do the right thing. I'm going to take away from the full fat. Take I'm the calories away. Take the calories away. But actually, it has quite the opposite effect. Mm. Yeah, it changes the way that your body thinks it's full or hungry and you actually end up eating more. So that's number one. They have more diabetes as a result because obviously obesity leads to diabetes. And we think there might be some links later down the line with cancer, but that will be because obesity increases your chances of 30 and, and, and that's right. And, and it's long been mooted there was a link with cancer. There are no studies that prove that. But, but we you're don't right. think, but I'm not saying that it's because of the aspartame. No, no indeed. indeed. Yeah. Well, there was a whole thing about that, yeah. wasn't there? But it is about, as you get bigger, yes. then your risk of all those cancers go up. So, I mean, the thing is, and I, you know, I don't know what you say to people. I watch people in the supermarket buying all this diet stuff, and I think you'd be better so, if you drank water. Do you know what? I was a victim of this almost. That so when I went out and I wanted a, not a, an alcoholic drink with my meals, I would have a Diet Coke. I no longer do that anymore. And do you know what I have? A Coke. I have sparkling water and lime. Right. And that's good enough. It's still sparkly, but it's water and I have some lime juice in it. Very nice indeed. The only um, soda I ever have is with gin. I knew you were going to say that. Well, there you are. You know me very well <laughs> indeed. Uh, right. I think it's time for a break. After the break, uh, we're going to be talking about more medical stories. We're also going to be talking about migraines and this brand new drug, which has been shown in clinical trials to reduce the number of migraines days by at least 50%. Don't go anywhere. This is Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman, trans woman is a man.
Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss it. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans. Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. Yeah, we're yeah, supposed it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to Weekend Breakfast. The time 9:22 already. Dr. Rene, Dr. Rene here as well. We're in the middle of our health hour. Lots of messages coming in. We're actually, I've got a, quite a few on migraine as well, which is lucky, really, isn't it? it? Is. We did have, we, we did this because someone messaged us about doing migraine. We again. we did because I think we spoke about migraine. Golly, I don't know when we did September. last September, I think, um, and we spoke to Rebecca Walker, and that's a really nice segue to say to to say it is time for Sunday surgery. Dr. David Bull's Sunday surgery. Now, this is all pegged to the fact there is a new daily pill that could halve the number of migraines suffered by up to 170,000 people after the medicine regulator recommended it for use. Uh, this is a new drug uh, which has been shown in clinical trials to reduce the number of migraine days by at least 50%. On the back of that, a migraine charity has called for swift access to the drug to ensure patients with the condition can benefit from them as quickly as possible possible. So it sounds like a, a great idea and a great treatment option. Well, joining us now this morning, Dr. Rebecca Walker, who's a GP and specialist in headache medicine and migraine at the National Migraine Centre. Good morning to you. Good morning, David. Lovely Good to talk to you. We, we last spoke in September and, and yes. obviously we were keen to do this because, as Rene said, we had people messaging in about migraine. We also had this, this new drug as well. Tell us about the new drug and how it works. So, um, Migraine is complex, but we know that there is an important chemical messenger in the brain called calcitonin gene-related peptide, and blocking the action of this um, messenger, which triggers migraine headache pain, uh, can be a really successful way of getting on top of migraine and controlling the condition, and this is the way that these new medications work. So, so let's just go back for people who don't know what we're talking about. I think people often say I have a migraine uh, or they use interchangeable language. Just can you define for us, the t because obviously there are different types of headache, exactly what a migraine is? So m migraine is a featureful headache and actually it's really interesting. You don't necessarily have to have headache to experience migraine. It's a 
complex brain condition that can involve other symptoms such as nausea, sensitivity to light, sound, movement, smell and touch. Headache is a common and often a dominant feature, but you also might have problems with higher thinking functions, so concentration and fatigue. Uh, and then you might be this, well, one of the three in 10 people who get what we call aura, which is a temporary disturbance of neurological functions, so zigzag lights in your vision, for example, or, or loss of sensation. And this is very different from a tension type headache for example which is often a band-like vice-like uh, pain around the head that usually settles with simple painkillers and doesn't have these all these other features associated with it so, so I'm really intrigued by that that aura we see an aura for example in epilepsy as well just talk us through the the, the aura here in migraine because it can present in a number of ways can't it it can. That's a really good question. So uh, there's lots that we still need to understand about aura, but essentially what's happening is there's an, uh, an, a wave of electrical excitation that moves over the surface of the brain. Our brain is divided up into different regions. We call them cortices. We have the visual cortex, the part of the brain that's responsible for sight, the part of the brain that's responsible for feeling and motor. And whichever bit of the brain this wave of electrical excitation hits will determine the type of aura that you have or, or that you experience as an aura sufferer. Uh and those symptoms can be very different, as you alluded to. So visual problems, I guess it depends which, courtesy, which cortex is involved in this. So visual problems, tingling, numbness, trouble speaking clearly, ringing in your ears and weakness. How different is that to auras that people might expect with, say, epilepsy? It's a it's a very good question. They might be very similar, and sometimes it's only with a very nice, a detailed history and time with a, an experienced clinician that will help you work out what's going on. Usually, aura with migraine is a short-lived phenomenon that lasts between five minutes and, and an hour, and is often followed by typical symptoms of migraine: the nausea, the vomiting, the the one-sided throbbing headache. Those are the typical features of migraine. And how common is migraine? very common. We see it in one in seven people in the UK. We know that it's more common in women. Three, It's three times more common in women. So that's about 11 million people living uh, in the UK with migraines. So it is a very common condition, mm. often unrecognised and very stigmatised. So, so let me bring in the general practitioner. I mean, do you, <laughs> you see migraine, I assume, a great yes. deal? Hello, Rebecca. Nice to see Hi, you again. Um, yes, and I think Rebecca just made a really interesting point that I will ask her to touch on for us. Um, as a GP, mm. I hate having headaches because it's really complex and difficult. And it's deciding, you know, whether this is just, as you say, a headache or whether it is migraine. So, so and also it's because th there are so many different types. So of many different types. But I think the being three times more common in women is really interesting. Mm. And I think there are a lot of women who get hormonal migraine, don't they, Rebecca? Yes. Absolutely. So it's very common for women to experience uh, migraine around the time of their periods. Migraine is essentially a condition uh, that is very uh, sensitive or responsive to changes in our internal uh, biochemistry or our internal hormonal environment, also our external environments too. So for women coming up to their periods where we have this drop in estrogen levels, that's a very common trigger for mm. what we call menstrually related migraine. Yeah. So to that end, we then often see women as they're coming into the perimenopausal mm. range getting migraines and then it's a fine balance between between getting the HRT level good enough to cope with their symptoms but not trigger migraines or make them worse or just make yeah. them better. And then again, women who, who are pregnant who get migraine, the migraines can get better or worse or just stay the same. So for women, it's really complex because they have other underlying issues going on. Yeah, it's fascinating. So ju just in terms of this new drug, if we can go back to that, Rebecca, this is atogapand. Now, you talked about it blocking uh, this receptor, this uh, CGRP, and obviously somehow changing the inflammatory response. Now, although it's been licensed um, and it, it's got the go-ahead, it's not that simple to get, is it? No, so I'm going to call it a todgepant. I think it, you know. <laughs> well, you can you, you call scone, it that. Scone. <laughs> yeah, well, well, I'm going to say I think you probably know better. I say me. mitochondria. He says mitochondria. Oh, it's mitochondria. Yeah. Everyone knows that. <laughs> Sorry, um, and you're right. So there are some hurdles, some criteria that need to be met. So nice. It's wonderful that nice are supportive of these uh, novel migraine medications, but we need to have tried uh, and not found effective. Usually, at least about three different other preventative medications before patients are offered these new, wow. new treatments. And and that's really frustrating for the patients as well, isn't it? It can be. It can be a little bit of a grind, really, to get through lots of medications that may or may not help. They may cause unpleasant side effects. Um, and so, sorry, Doctor. So, as this is, um, has an effect on calcitonin, Rebecca, is there any long-term worries about bone health? Because obviously calcitonin plays an important role there. 
Not that we're aware of, and so far I think we've been using calcitonin gene-related um, medication, uh, peptide-related medications for, for a good five to ten years. We're probably coming up to that ten-year long-term data set, not with the oral GPAN medications, but certainly with the monoclonal antibodies, and mm -hmm. so far there's no indication that it has an adverse yeah. impact on bone health. Can I, can I just ask you a question that's come in? Uh, a 14-year-old boy started migraine last year, has constant headache, cluster headaches, migraine, slash, slash, since the 4th of January, which no painkillers touched. Several migraine treatments have been tried with no relief. I've had an MRI, nothing found, been seen once online, online by a neurologist, has not been able to attend school since Christmas. What advice could you give, Rebecca? It's really difficult, and obviously I can't give individual Indeed. advice in this context, but I would always there are sort of three pillars to managing headache conditions. I always go back to basics, look at lifestyle measures. So the, the stuff that's very much easier said than done, but good routines, sleeping well, eating well, making sure you're regularly well hydrated, gentle, regular exercise, management of stress, then moving into talking about specific acute treatments that might help and then preventative treatments. Now it is difficult in young people because these new medications are not yet licensed for, for people under the age of 18. And, and just from your point of view, in terms of someone coming to you, when do you refer to, to a migraine specialist? It would example? actually be quite a way down the line, actually, because we would first of all make sure that we were happy that there was nothing underlying mm. going on. We would then start trialling different methods alongside, as Rebecca says, lifestyle changes and triggers, because people can, with a diary, often identify triggers. And we would start treating. Now, that could be a combination of treatments from hormonal, mm through to obviously citagliptin and oh, sorry citagliptin I'm going mad this morning we've been talking about those too much um, <laughs> super trip time. yes thank you we've been talking about the um, diabetic drugs dream, yes yes um, <laughs> super trip time and then all of the other trip times because there is not a class effect when treating migraine so if super trip time doesn't work we then mix, move on to change. another one yeah. so quite a long way down the line before we would refer to neurology unless it was someone with cluster headaches uh, can I just ask neurology. you Rebecca just in terms of causation you know we don't don't know exactly what causes migraines. Where are we in terms of that research? Are we getting closer to understanding? Because obviously we're talking about inflation, inflammation, and inflammatory responses. Yes, I think you're right. There, I mean, for many years, migraine's been under researched and and under investigated. So we are increasingly beginning to put together the the players on the football pitch, as it were. So we know CGRP is important. There's this, another one that's uh, been identified recently, PACAP, that's involved in this inflammatory response. So there is forward momentum which is very exciting it is very exciting indeed rebecca always such a pleasure to talk to you thank you very much thank indeed you. dr rebecca walker their gp and specialist in <coughs> headache medicine and migraine at the national migraine center and that was today's sunday surgery dr david bull's sunday surgery well, keep all your messages uh, coming in, please. It's really interesting, isn't it? And it does affect so many people. It, it, but yeah. also, I think it is the sort of dreaded thing for GPs. If someone comes in, and certainly when I was in A&E, if someone comes in and say, I got a headache, you mm. think, oh, right, here yeah. we go. Because it's actually very complex to diagnose. Really got to dig down and work out what's going on. But you know what? If I had a migraine, I'd want Rebecca talking to me. She has such a calming voice. Sorry, say it. Yeah, oh, no, she's brilliant, isn't she? <laughs> um, I believe we've got Alan in Cornwall on the line. Good morning to you. Good morning, doctors. Good morning. morning. How can we help? Um, well, it started about four or five months ago. All of a sudden, light headaches, and it just got worse and worse until it ended up 24 hours a day, seven days a week, headache. Every morning I wake up. I'm now getting up five, six o'clock in the morning. I'm retired. I'm 70 mm. with, like, pounding headache. And I've had various drugs. I was on some atropine. I'm now on... Almo trip ten. Yeah. Yes. Almo -trip -ten. Can, can you just explain the headache? What, just sort of tell us whereabouts the headache is, what it's like, is it linked oh, to anything? It, it has been pounding temples all around my eye sockets, my forehead, half my head on the left feels like it's had scalded water poured over it. It feels like mm. people sticking needles in the top of my head. And I need to ask you, Alan, has anyone at this stage done an MRI of your head? Not yet. Okay. Um, I, I did have a motorbike crash about a year before this started. A guy drove straight into the front of me, about 35, 40 mile an hour impact. Besides hitting him, I went down heavy on my left side. Mm. It, was in a, it was in a car park. I just finished a charity run. Right. Um, 
But I, I think, Alan, I would get onto your GP tomorrow morning, first thing, and say you want an MRI. Mm. I think for somebody of your age to suddenly get headaches that are getting worse and worse and debilitating, doesn't sound like a migraine, because migraines don't usually go on for five months without a break. I would want an MRI of your head to make sure there's nothing going on in there to cause the headache. Yeah. I've actually had, like, I've been to hospital where I've had CT scan, X-rays, blood oh. tests. So you've had a CT, uh, um, have you, did you say? Pardon? pardon? You, what scan did you have? A CT scan, and right. they nothing. Blood scans found nothing, X-rays. So, so yeah. that's good news, you, the CT yeah. found nothing, but I think René's right, which is the MRI oh, gives you uh, much better information. Oh, yes. Uh, a doctor actually asked me to go back over two years, and when I said about the motorbike crash, and she said, what damage did you sustain? Mm. I said, well, I bashed my head, but I had a crash helmet on. Right. Um, I damaged my shoulder. Uh, I didn't break anything, but I said my shoulder, I had physio on it nine months, because I still have trouble lifting my arms mm. slightly. Mm. I mean, I wonder if... Is, oh, sorry, is, the insurance were going to do an MRI on my arm, which I've been waiting for the headaches to clear so I could have it done, and she said, we'll get them to do a full... MRI on me head, yeah. which yeah. I'm waiting for at the moment. So she said, well, when they do it, get them to do a full head scan mm. and ask them if they can send it to the surgery yeah. as well. I think, I think that's a good idea. Mm. I mean, also, it sounds like you've been through quite a lot over the last year, and some of the descriptions that you're giving us around the temples, around the eyes, does sound very stress-related as well. It sounds almost like a tension headache. So that must always be in the mix. But before we get to that conclusion, I think I'd like to see an MRI as well. So I would do that, Alan, and good luck. Um, Sunlight. Sunlight. Yeah. Terrible for me at the moment. I, I'm sure, Alan, but I think that's really good advice. So you need to ring the GP tomorrow, so it's Monday tomorrow, ring the GP tomorrow and say, look, I want an MRI of my head just to exclude any underlying pathology. Um, and I think that's that's really good advice. Some just interesting comments, Randy, coming in. I suffered with cluster headaches for 10 years and they stopped with oxygen delivered through a face mm. mask at high flow. Please mention this. It changed my life. And that's Simon. Good morning. It's really interesting. Cluster headaches are absolutely debilitating. More men get those than women, and they come in bouts of about a week where you're just crying down one side of your face usually. Oh. The pain lasts for about 20 minutes, but then it comes in pulses across that time, literally every Horrible. hour. Horrid. Now, what do you think of this? I have a sister that has really, or has really bad migraines under the doctor for them, been there for years. Her migraines were triggered by citrus fruit, most definitely oranges. So she avoids oranges and high citrus fruit and juices, and her migraines aren't as bad, and sometimes she can avoid them. Absolutely, there mm. are food triggers for migraines. Some people are triggered by cheese and some by chocolate. Yes. Um, and again, I've got another one here said, I had significantly bad migraine, which were eventually diagnosed as uh, having some intolerance. A change of diet to foods uh, has also definitely helped me, which is really, really fascinating. Keeping all your messages coming in. Uh, let's take another call. Nissa is in Birmingham. Good morning to you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. How can we help? I, I I've got something called non-epileptic attack disorder. Um, they call it NIAD for short. Um, I've had it for probably about six, coming on seven years now, mm -hmm. where I've been prodded and poked. They thought it was syncope, then they thought it was my blood pressure. So, so can you explain uh, to people what symptoms you have? Um, I could be sitting, standing, walking, running, even lying down, and... Um, I can almost give the analogy, you know, when you're asleep and you have the sensation of falling and you have that kind of jolt. Mm. It is that jolt and I just, my legs go and I collapse, I pass out. Um, I Eyes are wide open, but I'm completely blind. I cannot see anything. I can hear everything around me. Um, naturally, my children and my wife, they're, you know, they're screaming in the background because I've I've fallen downstairs, fallen down escalators, fallen in the road. Um, I mean, I've fallen down all over the place and I've hurt myself. Um, NHS have kind of gone, um, they've bent over backwards to try and get, to find out what is it, what, what exactly it is. And, you know, they're, like I say, they've bent over backwards to try and find out and not come up with a conclusion. Now, eventually, they've put a label to it and they've called it non-epileptic attack disorder. Well, that, that's, I mean, it's really interesting, this. Um, 
what do you know about these kind of disorders? Because because obviously what you're, you're getting here is what sounds rather like a seizure, obviously. It does, yeah, and it, yeah. it, it looks like a seizure, but there isn't actually seizure activity going on in the brain. So that's why it's called non-epileptic attack mm. disorder. Yeah. Um, quite often, um, it's a, almost a dissociative experience where you're you're kind of stepping outside of your brain and there is some suggestion so your brain and your body disconnect yeah. it, it, that's what yeah. it feels like yeah, yeah. yeah. and yeah. but there is some suggestion that it can be triggered by the brain being unable to handle some of your thoughts emotions thoughts previous memories trauma and it can be linked back sometimes to a stress moment a post-traumatic stress disorder so that the, the only treatments really that people look at for these eventually once they get to that conclusion are psychological therapies to help you deal with those uh, ha had have you had any any therapy yeah I've had, I've had 10 nine bouts of cbt and we've kind of gone through my childhood and my early years and you know i've had a good childhood there's nothing kind of like traumatic that's been in my life i've had um a was there a precipitating being... cause you said you've had it six to seven years ago was there anything that happened around I that time he did have spinal surgery it was failed spinal surgery um i had metal work put into my back that kept on the screws kept on coming loose so i ended up having three surgeries um perhaps that they started after that mm. um Maybe that's what's caused it, but the frequency is the issue here, but I can have six or seven attacks per day. Yeah. Um, and what I tend to have, which kind of fits in with what you're talking about now, is I can have migraines after some of them. I don't always get migraines, and I've had all the tryptans. I'm on simitriptan as well. Mm -hmm. But what my uh, consultant prescribed me was Zomig nasal spray. Yeah. And mm. if I do get a really bad migraine, and I'll have one of the Zomig nasal sprays, and that is the only thing that works that takes away the migraine, the simitriptans and things like that do not work. Um, what about, so I mean, look, only... I'm really sorry that we don't have answers to this. You, you have yeah, one of those yeah. um, those things, but it's great that you're sharing your story with us and really interesting for us as well. What about alternative therapies like trying some acupuncture and things like that? Yeah, perhaps somebody has suggested that in the past as well, or going on a retreat somewhere and mm. completely chilling. I've been on holiday, and but you come back and I've had them whilst I've been on holiday as well. Yeah. And it's a really bizarre one where, you know, the NHS have said that we can, if they put me onto pyramate, uh, which is more for epilepsy and more for migraines, and it didn't help, and they upped my dosage and it didn't really help as well. So it's a really bizarre one where mm. I think it's more of a lifestyle thing where I'll probably end up having to live with it for the rest of my life. But, um, thank you for your time. Oh, no, thank well, you thank sharing. you. I'm thank sorry you. we can't provide better answers, actually, but it's, that's a fascinating mm. condition, And really difficult, because it? it's clearly affecting his yeah, life absolutely. dramatically. I, I don't know about you. Can you... I mean, obviously, we talked about it being stress-related and being some sort of precipitative cause, mm. but do you think it's likely that cause would have happened six to seven years ago when it came on, or do you think it's actually quite possible it was something much longer ago... I think it could be ..which either, has been actually. triggered by something more I mean, recently. going through three for spinal surgeries because they're not working is quite a stressful yeah, event, <laughs> I think. <laughs> Very. Yeah. I, would, I would say so, too. I just got a message here. Um, I'm slightly scared to, to now pronounce the name of that drug. Uh, Debbie says, uh, what's the name of that new migraine meds um atogapant or atoga how would you say it i'm not even gonna go no. there uh, well anyway a-t-o-g-e-p-a-n-t is how you spell it that's the new drug for migraines keep all of your messages um uh, coming in please uh, we'll take some more calls actually more of your medical uh, thoughts as well and we've got some more medical stories for you as well that's all coming up after this break this is talk tv Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, not a woman, trans woman. Isn't that? Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, 
that, yeah, I'm going to be getting the badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know what's I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans. Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, 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 did fail her. Yeah, we're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Back to the final part, final part, Doctor, of Weekend Breakfast Time, 9.46 on Sunday, April the 14th. Now, this is a really interesting read. Um, being a mother really does age you, according uh, to a study. Exasperated mothers often warn that the children will be the death of them. A new study suggests there may be some truth in the admonishment. Uh, pregnancy accelerates biological ageing. Each baby you have makes women grow older by up to 2.8 months, according to scientists. This is from Columbia University in New New York, they looked at 1,735 young people. Funnily enough, men are not impacted in the same way. No. Yes. Are you sure, David? Yeah. You might have just con committed a crime, <laughs> a hate crime. Oh, it probably is, actually. Isn't that funny, though? <laughs> and, and obviously, well, it's hardly surprising, is it? Right, so it's a nonsense study. <laughs> Let me tell you why. Go on, then. So we know that the more babies a woman has, the lower her risk of getting breast cancer. Doesn't mean she's not older, biologically. Breast cancer, yes, but breast cancer kills women. So lowering your risk actually extends your life. So the, the benefits of having yeah 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 yeah, but I far outweigh but I do two point eight months. No, but I just think it's true. I've seen you know you see what it does. I mean it's hard, but is it is it the biological aging or is it actually because you're absolutely exhausted? No, and I I don't <laughs> I think children are a joy. My child is a joy, and she enhances. She isn't always. She enhances my life no end. <laughs> Let's talk about this, though. Um, these are about forever chemicals. Mm. Uh, the government should ban 25 pesticides which contain so-called forever chemicals, according yeah. to campaigners. This is a real problem, PFA chemicals. And these are toxins which take centuries to break down in the environment. We're found in more than 3,300 samples. Strawberries. Tested by the UK government. Exactly. Strawberries are the worst affected, as 95% mm -hmm. contain these PFAs. And these have been classed, six of them, classed as highly hazardous. Also, when you looked at uh, many of the other fi uh, the, the foods as well, peaches, cucumbers, apricots, beans, all saw at least 15% of samples containing PFAs. I know. I think this is really sad. I think it's important to stress, though, before we panic everyone, yeah. that the levels found in food were not at a level high enough to be considered carcinogenic. That's right. So I think that's important. But I also think, you know, there is a, a, a big argument, again, to go to as organic a food as you can find but please don't think that gives you a get out of jail free no. card because many of these were organic as well of course and of course it's about cost <coughs> as well and, and yeah. making sure that we go back to traditional farming methods but it's I mean, also do you know that i only allow alex to have organic porridge because the pesticides in all other porridges are really really high mm. this is not just about fruit 
this is no, well, no, I know it's it's absolutely everywhere. But of course, it it comes with a cost to to yes. to eat uh, to eat like that. Of course, and I do think this is an important study, given the growing body of evidence linking PFAs to serious diseases such oh, as agree. cancer. It's deeply worrying that UK consumers are being left with no choice but to ingest these chemicals, yeah. many of which remain in their bodies long into. Well, this the is the future. key, isn't it? It's about having no choice. Mm. It is about yeah. having no choice. Can we, can, I mean, this is a bit of a naughty story, but I oh. rather liked it. Um, Sierra Leone has declared a oh. national emergency over a psychoactive this is really sad. drug. I know it is, I know. So there's an abuse of this drug, and it's called Kush, and they are forcing police officers to guard cemeteries in Freetown. This is the weirdest story ever. So basically, this is Kush. It's a drug made from a variety of substances, including toxic chemicals, herbs, cannabis, disinfectant, and ground up human bone because ground up human bone has sulfur in it because it has sulfur in it so to get their high they're digging up human remains crushing them up making the drug kush and this is now a national emergency because sulfur apparently potentiates the high yes yes and and so what they're now seeing is this influx of people into psychiatric hospitals in sierra leone because the drug is actually having these incredible uh, psychological effects on these patients i mean the whole thing is deeply tragic actually. it's deeply tragic it's deeply worrying and also david i don't know what you think about this is there a risk there is dna in bones 100 is there a risk of infections of like course. hiv yes absolutely you know absolutely I mean, or prion this diseases this is how desperate or prion diseases this is how yeah. desperate these people are to get a high yeah and these are young men between 18 and 25 now between 2020 and 2023 admissions to the sierra leone psychiatric hospital rose 4,000 percent. Doesn't it also go back to what we talked about before about drugs generally yes. is that there has always been in human nature a need to use drugs or whatever to get high and it just shows doesn't it when you stop one another one starts. I mean this is particularly unpleasant and also. But the it also shows the lengths that people will go uh, to. Yeah digging up bones yeah. to get high it costs 20p a joint and that's why um, that's why, obviously, it's taken off, but obviously a huge problem. Um, and it, it, it's interesting, they, they say about it, I don't know very much about Kush, they say it takes you to another world where you don't know yourself. It's like it has something demonic in it. They see their friends and people around them dying, and they still take it. It's, it's bizarre. I mean, one could argue that it would be much safer and kinder to give these people sulphur. Just hand it out yeah. so they don't have to dig up bodies. They, they, they go on, actually. This is a consultant psychiatrist in Sierra Leone Psychiatric Teaching Hospital saying, actually, it is so dangerous, uh, like heroin, like cocaine. It's strong, it's cheap, and it's easily available, and there is very weak regulation. It's a really tragic story, that. So um, the drug problem is not just in the West? No, not at all, not, not at all. But of, uh, it goes down to cost as well, doesn't it? So yeah. therefore you, you find ways uh, around that as well. Let's have a look at... Have you, what else have you got coming in, by Oh, way? I've got so many things coming in, and you've just caught me on the oh, hop, sorry. obviously, but that's OK. Um, so, love your programme, Dr Renee. Quite rightly, is keen to promote the benefits of HRT, but it caused my fibroids to grow and I got heavy periods. Fibroids are not uncommon. So, yes, fibroids usually get better when you go through menopause because you lose estrogen, but then, actually, if you give people HRT, they can. They don't always grow. So, I answered that to say there is a school of thought to say that a hysterectomy is a life-saving operation at that age because you then don't have the fibroids. You can have unopposed estrogen. Of course you can. Which lowers your risk of breast cancer mm. against the general population. Very interesting. Let's take another call. Jim is in Chelmsford. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. morning. What can we do for you? you? Um, just give you a brief one. My wife suffered uh, a brain injury uh, about four years ago. Um, she had an accident and uh, suffered a subdermal hematoma, yeah. Yeah. Uh, which has um, uh, spent uh, about, about four or five hours in uh, Addenbrooke's hospital having it um, Drained. relieved. Drained. Yeah. Um, and now, uh, obviously, she's been left with um, problems. Uh, dysphagia is one, but it's quite small. Mm. But um, mood swings, um, quite a lot. Unfortunately, she's in a care home uh, now uh, because of this. I, I personally can't look after her when she, uh, when she actually um, changes, if you understand what I'm saying. Yeah. Uh, normally we can have a nice conversation she's really a nice person and then then she can flip to the other way and uh, totally different but anyway 
getting to the crux, um, obviously uh, she's been taking medication to try and um, um, ease the uh, the problems that she's got. She's under um, um, a mental health um, type of um, program at the moment. Mm -hmm. But what I what I tried to do is I tried to have a look around and I got interested in stem cell. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and uh, but I'm I, I probably it's a little bit of a stretch because it's it's quite new at the moment, isn't it? And I wondered if it would help her brain injury in some way. I mean, look, your story I think is so tragic. Her life changes so quickly. Um, it sounds like your your wife possibly has a frontal lobe um, issue, which is why she's obviously changing in mood, which obviously and personality. affects personality. Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know enough about stem cells to advise you or on your wife's condition, but I always say this to people, it's absolutely healthy to research outside of what the doctors are telling you and go back to them and say, look, what about this? I love it when my patients come up with, I've Googled this, what do you think? Because sometimes I learn things and it's an opportunity to have an open discussion. And I think that's absolutely right. And I know from my own personal experience that actually some clinicians are very closed mm. and they say, and they will push back and say, no, this is, this is actually what we believe. But actually, if you can back it up and say, look, there's a paper in the United States or wherever it is that says that this might be useful at least you can open that conversation can't you with yeah. a clinician and a good doctor will say let me go away and look at it exactly for you. yeah i tried to get this information from a company I, I won't name the company but i would have to get my wife to um to budapest for them to be able to treat her mm. obviously that's uh, an expense obviously yeah and, uh, and, and, and difficult to do yes and very difficult to do um uh, but they wouldn't give me a lot of information. They wanted more information about my wife, uh, what her medical records and things. And I was quite resident, uh, you know, not really wanting to give them that information, uh, trying to get more information from them if they mm. thought it would be uh, some sort of... Uh, it might be worth, as long as you think the company's bona fide and you've checked them out, it might be worth yeah. handing over your medical records, your wife's medical records, because they might find her a case that they could use in one of their trials. Yeah. Which would then be much I mean, cheaper, I was, I was going to say, also, I mean, a lot of these, these clinics are running online uh, consultations as well. I don't know whether they do that. They need the medical history, though, because otherwise... Yeah. And they need the scans. They need to see what they're dealing with. So, actually, I, in this case, I think it is worth you actually sharing that information. Okay, okay. Um, would, would, in that case, uh, I would have to give them the um, the, the right to, to get her medical... Um um, well, if uh, you've got power of attorney, you can do that. Otherwise, she has to. She has that. to do it. Yeah, and well, it, she, yeah, no, she can't do that. And I've got um, court of protection. Okay, right, fine. So, so yes, you you can do <clears throat> do that, Jim. Uh, good luck. Thank you. For uh, that. I hope that is helpful. Uh, thank you very much indeed for all your calls uh, this morning. I hope they, uh, that we've been able to uh, help in some small way. Peter Cartwell. Good Hello there. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hi. Hi. Uh, well, the uh, Health Secretary, Victoria Atkins, has been in the media this morning. She's confirmed that British fighter jets were involved yesterday yeah. in regard to uh, sorting out the uh, attack of Iran on Israel. We're talking about that a lot I'm this sure. morning and whether we are sleepwalking towards World War Three and what Iran does next, what especially what Israel does next. We're talking to Israel. I mean, guests. and also from your side, political pressure being applied as well. It'll be interesting, mm. actually, to see what the G7 say, yeah. what Biden is saying. Yeah. And, well, the UN Security Council has been called at Israel's request and that's happening later today so um, presumably there'll be no retaliation before then. We'll yeah. get into all of that we've got to talking to people across the Middle East we're talking to Iran experts, we're talking to uh, people who are uh, defence experts here in the UK, uh, we're talking to people in Jerusalem, All we're, we've got it covered right. um, we're also talking about pensions and whether the pension rise is actually that uh, all it's cracked up to be because there are some major questions over How that. How are you finding it? Uh, I, I, I must say I've noticed a difference in my, in my pay packet. You, yes. are, you are so rude doctor. I <laughs> know well I'm just used to it. Uh, we're also talking as well uh, not just about pensions but also Australia and uh, we will talk about Australia as well and uh, the right, horrible yes, attacks in Sydney yesterday. Also we've got uh, Ian Aitchison one of my favourite guests he is a senior advisor on the counterterrorism project but he's also a, 